Okay, it's half past three. I think we can start. So, welcome everybody to this uh, ICEP uh, 2020. Today we will start uh, with our first first uh, uh, live session for uh, track 14. We are uh, 60 people connected, uh, 62, so uh, probably some, someone else will join uh, during, uh, during the, the, the afternoon. This session is uh, subdivided in uh, three blocks uh, with uh, two coffee break uh, in between. So before starting, uh, please uh, let me remind you some uh, technical, uh, te technical details for the, for, for the organization. Uh, please uh, uh, mute uh, yourself uh, unless uh, you are speaking. Then uh, at the end of each presentation, if you want to ask a question, please uh, use the rise end option provided by, by Zoom. And uh, uh, just to make the, uh, I mean, the, the, um, the session more, uh, more, more friendly, uh, present yourself, say your name before asking your, uh, your question. If you cannot use uh, the rise and option, there is also the chat box uh, by, provided by, by Zoom. Then, uh, as uh, you know, uh, there is also a Mattermost channel that is available, and uh, this uh, allows to continue the discussion offline. I mean, after the talk, after each talk is finished, or more general, after the session is, uh, is ended. Then, uh, as I said before, uh, we will have a two coffee break. During this break, uh, the, the, the Zoom connection will stay open and uh, will stay on and active. And this uh, uh, will allow to uh, have some uh, informal discussion uh, among, among people. Then to come to the speaker, we already try with a large majority of you that uh, there is no uh, main issue in uh, sharing slide and in the microphone. Uh, you all have 20 minutes, that means uh, 15 uh, minutes for the talk and five for the question. Uh, I was thinking to uh, inform you when five minutes and then two minutes are left uh, before the end of your presentation. If you prefer something different, okay, please uh, tell me uh, before uh, uh, before uh, you start uh, you start your talk. So uh, I think that these are the most important uh, information. In the meantime, we are uh, 74, uh, 74 people. So uh, I think that now we can start. The first speaker is uh, Chen that will um, that will present us uh, application of uh, quantum machine learning to high energy uh, physics analysis at LHC using uh, IBM quantum computing simulator. So please, uh, uh, Chen, share your slide, uh, open your microphone, and uh, turn on your uh, your. Just a minute, I would play the intro. Please stop the sharing. I will share the intro and then we can start. Okay. Okay. Uh the following message is best viewed on an oscilloscope.
Hello. Hello. Uh, may I, sh I share the slide now? Uh, I think so. Okay, I will go ahead to share the slides. That. Okay, so I guess everything is uh, all set to start. Perfect, go ahead, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. So, uh, yes, so I'll talk about, uh, I'll give a talk about application of uh, quantum machine learning to HEP analysis at the LC using IBM quantum computer simulators and hardware. So I'm uh, giving this talk on behalf of a collaboration uh, of uh, University of Wisconsin, IBM, uh, CERN, IBM, Fermilab, BNL, and also uh, State University of New York. Okay, so machine learning has become uh, uh, one of the most popular and the powerful techniques and tools for high-energy physics data analysis. It greatly enhances our ability to identify rare signal against immense backgrounds, which is important for discovery of new physics. Now, there are some uh, issues raised by machine learning. Uh, one is the, uh, uh, the heavy CPU time is needed to train uh, complex models. With more data, the training time increases very quickly. The second is uh, it may lead to local optimization instead of uh, global optimization. Quantum computing may solve such issues. It, quantum computing is a way of parallel execution of multiple processes using qubits. It can speed up certain types of problems effectively. It is also possible that the quantum computing can find a different and perhaps, perhaps better way to perform machine learning. Okay, so our goal is uh, to perform LC energy physics analysis with quantum machine learning to explore and to demonstrate the potential of quantum computers can be a new computational paradigm for big data analysis in HEP. And our preliminary program is to employ the quantum support machine QSVM method with the IBM gate model quantum computers and the IBM KISC environment to LC high physics analysis. For example, the TTH H2 gamma gamma analysis and H mu mu analysis, which are two uh, recent LC flagship analysis. IBM KISS kit is uh, IBM quantum information science kit framework. Uh, here we show our workflow for the quantum machine learning. Uh, our workflow starts with uh, uh, making input events, for example, in a TTH H2 gamma gamma analysis, each event, for each event, the number of features or variables is 23. The second step is PCA, uh, principal component analysis. It is used to convert or combine features into fewer features to match the number of qubits. The third step is feature map. Uh, it encodes classical variable to quantum states currently uh, the number of encoded variables has to equal the number of qubits, for example, 5, 10, or 20. So that's why we need a, a PCA step. And the last step in the workflow is quantum machine learning. Uh, for example, we can use the uh, quantum support vector machine QSVM variational method, for example. Uh, and this is described in the next page. So in 2018, a uh, variational quantum SVM method was introduced by IBM and published in uh, Nature. Uh, this variational quantum SVM method can be summarized in the following four steps. The first step is to uh, add a feature map. Uh, you, uh, you find x to, uh, to encode the classical data into a quantum state. And then the second step is to uh, apply short depth variation of circuit W theta, which is uh, parameterized by gate angles theta. And the third step is to measure the quantum state in a standard basis. And the last step is to assign a classification label uh, through the action of a diagonal operator F in a standard basis. So during the training phase, a uh, set of events are used to train the circuit W theta to reproduce the correct classification. Uh, 
And then those uh, get angles set up are fixed in the testing stage. All right, so uh, then next page, we show another method we are studying, which is uh, the kernel quantum SVM method. So for classical SVM, uh, there's a well-known kernel trick, which uh, it maps the nonlinear separable data into a higher dimensional feature space using a kernel function that measures the similarity between the two data, any two data points. Then uh, it uses the kernel to find a separating hyperplane. And then there's a quantum kernel estimation method introduced by ABM and also in the published in the same Nature article. So this method maps classical data X nonlinearly to a quantum state using quantum feature map function, the same as previous page. And then it calculates the kernel matrix as the inner product of the overlap of two wave functions for any two data points using a quantum computer. Then it trains, uh, then uh, the method trains the class classical SVM in the same way as the, then the method trains the quantum SVM in the same way as the classical SVM. In the bottom, uh, it shows a quantum circuit uh, to evaluate the kernel matrix for two different uh, data points, X and Z. Right, so then we move to the next part in point QSM, where QSVM variational method to TTH gamma gamma and H2 mu mu analysis. So let me uh, briefly talk about TTH gamma gamma analysis uh, by the Atlas collaboration. So the lab plot is a, a diagram diagram for the TTH production. The observation of the TTH production by Atlas and CMS collaborations uh, directly confirm the interaction between the Higgs bosons on the top clock. And then on the right hand side is a di uh, diphoton mass spectrum uh, from a uh, uh, atlas uh, result for the for the TTH H2 gamma gamma analysis. So you can see a peak uh, in the di diphoton mass spectrum coming from the TTH event. So using boost decision tree, BGT, a classical machine learning technique technique with the HBoost package. The Atlas collaboration observes the TTH H2 gamma gamma process. In this talk, we will perform the machine learning based event classification for the TTH H2 gamma gamma analysis in a hydronic channel with Delphi simulation samples and quantum machine learning. In the next page, we uh, also briefly talk about the H mu analysis by the Atlas collaboration. Uh, the left is the diagram for the HMMU decay, which HMMU decay is the most promising process to observe the couplings between the Higgs boson and second generation fermions at the LC. On the right hand side, you see the uh, uh, dimuon mass spectrum uh, from a uh, Atlas, Atlas recent paper for the uh, H2 mu mu analysis. So using boost decision tree with the S3 boost package again, the Atlas collaboration searches for the HMU decay, and this talk uh, will perform the machine learning based event classification for the HMU analysis in the WBF channel with Delphi simulation samples and the quantum machine learning. All right, so then uh, moving to the uh, quantum work uh, with 10 uh, of us, with 10 qubits, we successfully finished training and testing with 100 events with IBM Kiski QASM simulator. Here, the 100 events means 100 training events plus 100 tester events. And Q simulator, uh, quantum, uh, meaning quantum circuit simulator, here the Kiski QASM simulator is used. And our simulator incorporates the hardware noise. Our quantum circuit is optimized to best fit the constraints imposed by hardware, including, uh, for example, qubit connectivity and hardware noise, uh, as well as the nature of the data. In addition, the SPSA optimizer is here used with 1,000 iterations. Iteration indicates the number of times uh, the algorithm's parameters are updated in the training process. And then on the next page, we'll just give some uh, simple definitions. So the log, uh, log curve is a graph showing background rejection versus signal efficiency. And then in the bottom, you see an example of log curve. 
And AUC uh, is defined as area under the rock curve. So these two terms are widely used uh, metrics to, uh, for, uh, to judge the machine learning algorithm performance. Okay, so then here we show some results employing the QS variational methods with the IBM simulator uh, as the log curves. So on the left, we show uh, the raw curves for the TTH analysis. On the right hand side, we show the raw curves for the HMU analysis. In each plot, the blue curve is the raw curve for the quantum simulator. The yellow curve is, the, is for the quantum uh, classical SVM, while the green curve is for the classical BDT. For the TTH analysis on the left, the BDT AUC is the open A3, classical SVM AUC is the open A3, and the quantum simulator AUC is, is the open A1. And then for the HMU mu analysis on the right, the classical BDT AUC is the open A0, Classical SVM AUC is 0.82, and then the quantum simulator AUC is 0.83. So using TTH and the HMU mu analysis data set, both with 100 events and 10 variables, QSVM variational on the simulator are performed similarly with classical BDT and the classical SVM. Moreover, uh, with sorry, the help you are, of- uh, Sorry, five minutes left. Huh? Okay, thanks. So with the help of IBM Restrict, Fermilab, and BNL, we have finished multiple jobs on the IBM hardware based on the superconducting electronic circuits. Uh, one is IBM Bobling, a 20 qubit machine, and the other is IBM Paris, a 27 qubit machine. We use 100 training events, 100 test events, and 10 qubits. For each event, due to a current limitation of hardware access time, we apply the QSVM variational method to only one data set on quantum hardware rather than 10 data sets on quantum simulator. Now here we show the involvement of the loss function with uh, uh, versus number of iterations. So the blue, uh, for, uh, the blue curve here is the quantum simulator uh, loss curve while the red curve is for quantum hardware and loss itself is defined as the mean of the square difference between the output scores for the quantum algorithm and the ideal scores. So you can see in the training process, uh, the hardware lo loss is, is decreasing with the increase of number of iterations. This indicates the quantum computer has the ability to learn how to differentiate between the signal and background. Next page, we show some uh, raw curves for importing the QS uh, the variational method with the IBM hardware. So again, we show the TTH results on the left, HMU results on the right. And then each plot, the blue curve is the uh, quantum simulator raw curve, while the red curve is the quantum hardware raw curve. And then on the left, the TTH, for TTH, hard, hardware AUC is 0.82, simulator AUC is 0.83. On the right, the HMU, uh, the hardware AUC is 0.81, the simulator AUC is 0.83. So using the TTH and the HP mute and the next data sets and the 250 iterations, the QSVM variational on quantum hardware and the QSVM variational on quantum simulator are in good agreement. Okay, we can now move to another part, which is importing the kernel method, QSVM kernel method to TTH gamma, gamma, H2 gamma gamma analysis. So we are performing an analysis using the QSVM kernel method with 10 qubits. Uh, customer feature, a customized feature map is adopted and the grid search with cost radiation is used to optimize the SVM. Hyperparameters, for example, C, the regularization parameter, below is just an example for the uh, grid search. Moving to page 18, uh, so here we show uh, results of importing the kernel method with Q simulator, the plot shows the AUC as a function of number of events. Uh, in this plot, the, uh, the blue curve is the quantum kernel results on the simulator. The green curve is the BDT result. The yellow curve is the SVM result. So at the moment, so at the moment, an uh, advantage of using the QSVM kernel method is the running for both simulator and the hardware are much faster. It enables us to work with a large number of events. This was not feasible with the QSVM variational method. Another remark is using TTH 
uh, there is a data set, 100 event to 1600 events, and 10 variables, the QSVM kernel simulator performs similarly with classical BDT and the classical SVM. Next page, we show the kernel method results in hardware. So here is the log curve for 100 events and 10 qubits. Again, the red curve is for, from the simulator, while the red curve, the blue curve is from simulator, the red curve is from hardware. And, um, and then the hardware for this uh, study, the hardware AUC is 0 0.82, simulator AUC is 0 0.83. So, can, so using the TTH and then the data set, uh, the, discri the distribution power of the QSVM kernel method on the hardware is currently similar to that on the quantum simulator. Okay, so now uh, that brings to my summary. Using IBM quantum computer simulators and hardware, we have employed the quantum machine learning, QSVM variational and the kernel methods to two LC HEP flagship analysis, TTH, H2 gamma gamma and H2 mu mu with Delphi simulation events. Firstly, with 100 events and 10 qubits, QSVM variational method on the quantum simulator performs similarly with classical BDT and classical SVM. Secondly, with 100 to 1600 events and 10 qubit, the QSVM kernel method on the quantum simulator performs similarly also with the classical uh, methods. And, that, and thirdly, with 100 events and 10 qubits for both variational and the kernel methods, the quantum hardware and the quantum simulator show comparable performance. And this point is for the illustrated in this table in my last slide. So comparing the middle row and the last row, uh, the middle row for the simulator while the last row for the hardware, you see uh, comparable results. And then uh, if in this table, if you compare the middle column for the variational method and the last column for the kernel method, you'll see, you also see the numbers are in, uh, comparable, but please note here, the quantum uh, variational method and the quantum kernel method runs are not using the identical data set. And several last remarks. Our results demonstrate quantum machine learning on the hardware of game model quantum computers has the ability to differentiate signal and background in realistic physics data sets. We will investigate further optimization. Hopefully, we will see QS where methods outperform classical machine learning methods. Furthermore, future quantum computers might offer speed ups in machine learning, which could be critical for our HEP community. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Now we can move to question. Massimo. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, hello, this is Massimo Caccia from Università dell'Insube and INFM Milano. I have a very trivial question. I, I'm afraid I missed the point. You said that using quantum computer can offer actually a considerable speed up but I haven't seen actually any estimate of the speed up that you mentioned. Can you give me just a hint? So which is the speed up factor that you had over 100 events qubits versus 100 events with a regular standard computer? Right, so yeah, so so our work in this, so this, this talk itself is mainly focusing on the, uh, the separate, separating signal from background and for the speed up, uh, so uh, some, uh, uh, for example, some uh, Nature Review article uh, indic uh, states that for the uh, quantum support vector machine method, generally there would be a exponential speed up. Uh, but you haven't done any testing yourself, so it's just a proof of concept. Right. So let, uh, let yeah. That statement is based on a theoretical calculation done by uh, like uh, some uh, the quantum okay. theorist. Yeah. So in our case, we are focusing on performance and uh, for the moment, uh, for the moment, because the quantum hardware is in the early stage, so we cannot really test the speed at this moment to show the uh, okay. exponential. Speed. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Ashraf. Uh, yes, I have a question on slide 14. 
Um, I wonder about the residual differences between the, the residual differences between the simulation and hardware implemented uh, trainings. Is there any parameter that's not taken into account in simulation and persists in um, uh, IBM hardware, or uh, what, what is the source? What do you expect about the source of of these residual differences? Right. So. Uh, uh, I don't know if uh, some collaborators of me wants to comment on that. Otherwise, I think uh, for our quantum simulator, uh, yes, the quantum simulator itself is not uh, perfect. So although it tries to uh, incorporate the hardware noise, uh, not all the uh, not every all the hardware noise in pace included. And uh, mm -hmm. also, we know the hard uh, is uh, also we know the hardware situa situation is uh, is changing uh, over time. While for the simulator, for the moment, we have to use a constant uh, uh, situation to do, uh, for all the iterations here. Okay, that is. Please so go ahead. When, uh, yes, one, one, at, one, at, one. A, at a quantum stage, the quantum simulator can only simply simulate some noise. It, the quantum simulator can't simulate all quantum noise. That's why there, are, there is a difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is time for uh, one uh, very fast question by Leeds, uh, and then uh, uh, the discussion should move uh, on uh, the matter most. Please, Liz, go ahead. Okay, um, I saw that you made a comparison between the quantum method and um, some of the more uh, traditional ones. And um, my first question is, is um, are they all trained on the same Delphi's data set? Mm, yes, they are. Okay. And why did you choose Delphi's? I mean, is the simplest of the simulations the least um, accurate? Uh, why, why Delphi's? Did you need lots of statistics or was it um, just convenience? Or, you, you know, why? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's mainly uh, for the convenience. Okay, okay. So you didn't think that the um, physics correctness had any, um, any influence on your um, research results. So you just went with the simplest thing. Is that, is that how, and how many events did you need to train the, um, the quantum network? Well, so, uh... Yeah, so we want to test uh, as we want to test different uh, sample sizes for the kernel methods. You, you see, we are uh, we do the training uh, uh, with one hundred events or, or and with one uh, sixteen hundred events. Okay. So that's the event currently we are is, is polling, and we also hope to do even to train even more to be able to be more like a real atlas or CMS analysis. Okay. That's it for me. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, so uh, we thank the speaker again. Thank you very much, Chen. And uh, as I said before, the discussion can continue on Martemost. And uh, here we can move uh, to the second talk uh, by Gilles on the impact of modern deep learning technique to the performance and time requirement of classification model in high energy physics. Okay. Um... Are you able to see and share in here? Yes, sir. Okay, excellent. Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my name's Giles. I'm a researcher with the University of Padova, uh, INFN. 
Uh, I'll be talking here and giving a brief overview about a paper that I recently brought out in which I was looking into how recent advances in deep learning, what real impacts they bring when they're, when they're applied in the context of a typical search at uh, the LHC. So, um, quick bit of introduction motivation. Uh, I want you to imagine a typical search at, um, at the LHC. Normally nowadays at the end, you'll have an event level classifier uh, trying to determine whether a given event is signal or background. Now, over the course of this analysis, uh, this, is, this classifier is going to be retrained over and over again. Sometimes at short notice, maybe you have to give a report tomorrow and you need the results now. So you really want to be able to train this in under a day. Uh, and at this level, you have uh, very limited hardware to hand. Uh, most analyzers, they'll have a laptop. Possibly they'll have access to uh, a shared GPU that they have to uh, request beforehand. So really, whatever technology you're working with, it has to work well on a laptop. Uh, and then in terms of when you actually want to apply this, it really depends on how much data you have uh, and how many times you need to rerun uh, per event, so possibly you need to include systematic variations. So, yeah, ideally you want to process the entire data set in under an hour, uh, under a few hours maybe, uh, so that you then have time to analyze the results for the report tomorrow. And again, uh, this is going to be running on a CPU. Uh, yeah, you can't assume uh, GPU access. Now, back in 2014, there was a competition run on Kaggle uh, called HiggsML. This was designed to simulate uh, a typical data analysis level application of machine learning and high physics. Now, the entrants to this were both physicists and professional data scientists. So really, there was a lot of strong competition here. Now, if we look at the winning solution uh, of Hill and White, this used an ensemble of 70 deep neural networks. Uh, so top performance in this, um, in this example requires 13 hours uh, on a rather expensive GPU. Now, if we account for hardware improvements, uh, possibly uh, this can all be run in 110 minutes, but you still need to have this GPU. If you only have CPU available, it takes 36 hours on an eight core CPU. Uh, maybe your laptop doesn't have eight cores, so that's going to be less. Um, yeah, let's say typically you have your laptop, maybe you have a schedule of access to a GPU. So what I was thinking was, have there been any uh, improvements in deep learning since 2014 that when applied in a high energy physics uh, context, improve our sensitivity to signal, reduce the training time and application time required, uh, and perhaps also reduce the hardware that is required. So I thought, let's use the HIGSML data set uh, as a benchmark and, and see. So move um, Brief overview about the data set itself. So this is 2012 Atlas Monte Carlo uh, Gen 4 simulation. The signal is Higgs to die tau, and then we have three main backgrounds as well. Uh, events are pre-selected into the semi-electronic channel. So you have these two towers. Uh, one decays off to an electron or, out or a muon, and the other um, decays to quarks. You get this uh, tau jet. There's a quarter of a million events available for training and just over half a million events for testing. And each event is defined by 31 features. Uh, there's low level information. So this is the three momenta of the final states plus up to two jets, PT ordered, uh, if they are present. Uh, and then there's also high level information. So there's angles, invariant masses, and also this uh, fitted uh, dital mass. Now, this is aimed to replicate a realistic search. So the metric that's being used to compare solutions is the approximate median significance. Uh, this is uh, this long complicated formula here. Basically, it's uh, a more accurate version of signal over square root of background. So the baseline model that I started with, this was a four layer 100 neuron a uh, fully connected network with ReLU activation, so something pretty standard. I was using ADAM to minimize the weighted binary cross entropy. Uh, and the learning rate uh, I found using a learning rate rangefinder test uh, described in these two papers here. 
There's also a, sh uh, a summary in the backups as well. By training an ensemble of 10 such classifiers, this achieves a metric score of uh, 3.664. So we've still got quite a way to go before we start reaching uh, the winning solutions performance. So moving on to testing out the new methods. Uh, I'll be presenting these in the order that I tested them. However, to save some time, I'll be skipping over a few of them. Uh, and indeed, actually, I'll skip over the first. This was a new way of handling categorical features in the data. It gave a small improvement, um, but there's only one categorical feature in the data, so it's not uh, the best testing ground for it. The first thing that really gave an advancement in improvement was data augmentation. Uh, this involves creating copies of data by exploiting the invariances between the inputs and the target. So if we imagine uh, image classification, here you can flip, zoom, rotate, and adjust the images. Uh, however, the actual object pictured in the image doesn't change class. Now you can apply this at training time in order to artificially increase the amount of training data that you have. Uh, and you can also apply it at testing time in order to get multiple predictions per data point and then create an average. Now, in terms of physics, uh, CMS and Atlas detectors, um, we can exploit the azimuthal and the longitudinal invariances uh, in events. Basically, if you imagine you have the final states, all that really matters is the relative positions of the final states with respect to one another and not the absolute orientation of the entire event. So we can rotate in phi, flip an eta, uh, and then flip neither uh, the x or y axis as well. The alternative is to completely remove this symmetry by setting a common alignment for all the events. However, in the end, I found that actually it was better to apply the data augmentation. And this resulted in a very large improvement in performance. Unfortunately, I'm accompanied by uh, a large increase in the training and the application time. However, it was still reasonable to use. Uh, I'll skip over a few new methods, a few uh, more methods. Um, a lot of these get replaced, so uh, there was a learning rate schedule that we replaced in the end. Also some advanced ensembling, again, we replaced those. This uh, swish activation function gave a small improvement, uh, nothing to write home about. Um, so moving on to the one cycle schedule. This uh, was introduced by Smith in 2018. It adjusts the learning rate of your optimizer uh, throughout your training and also adjusts the momentum in the opposite direction. Basically, you start off with a, an initial warm-up phase where you gradually increase the learning rate. Uh, then you reach a very high learning rate. Uh, and this is where your, a lot of your main learning happens. This is a very high learning rate. However, you've also then dropped the momentum. And uh, having low momentum with a high learning rate helps to stabilize the training. Uh, you stick at this high learning rate for a while and gradually drop it down uh, until you um, approach very close to zero. And this is the actual convergence phase where you're really narrowing in on the, the minima. Now, using this, I was able to halve the required training time in order to reach the same level of performance. The final thing I tested was uh, dense connections. So in image um, data uh, with convolutional architectures, there is uh, this dense net architecture. This uses a channel-wise concatenation in order to allow every single layer, um, no matter how deep it is, to have direct access to all previous representations of the data. This means that uh, data is never lost, um, and you have a more direct uh, flow of gradient during the back propagation. This reduces the required number of free parameters in the model basically because you're never having to encode potentially useful information for later layers. It always has direct access. And I was thinking, um, the deep neural networks that we're working with here aren't convolutional. However, we can still get a same, uh, similar idea of this dense connection by instead using a width-wise concatenation of previous hidden states. Uh, if you imagine you have your hidden state here, you can actually do this uh, skip connection around it and then concatenate on the previous hidden state to the new hidden state. In this way, you still always retain all the previous representations of the data. Uh, this places less reliance on getting the exact settings of the width and the depth correct. 
so I reduced the layer width down to 33, which is the number of inputs into the original model, uh, and then increased the number of layers. So we're now working with six layers. And overall, this reduced the number of free parameters by a third. It gave a small improvement in performance, which is quite nice. Uh, fortunately, a small increase in training time due to the fact that you don't have to do these concatenations. So having then fixed the model, I then evaluated... Sorry, you have still five minutes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, having then fixed the model, uh, I then evaluated on the private AMS. Uh, I found that um, the performance of my solution was able to match the winning performance within uncertainty. Uh, however, we were able to achieve very large uh, speed ups in terms of the training time and the application time. So to give you an idea about this, uh, the GPU I was using was a 1080 Ti. Uh, the CPU was a MacBook Pro 2018, so it's uh, an Intel i7. There's a few more hardware testings in the backups as well. Uh, so accounting for the difference in GPU, so this was going from a 2013 Titan up to a 2017 Ti, uh, 1080 Ti. The winning solution, that takes about 100 minutes to train, uh, whereas mine takes eight minutes. So that's 92% speed up. Uh, in terms of testing, uh, eight minutes effective on for the first place, 15 seconds um, just to evaluate at least 10 DNNs. So 97% speed up. Now, if you don't have access to a GPU, this still works uh, pretty well on the CPU. So we can train the model in 14 minutes, and then we can apply it in three minutes. The breaking down the source of where these uh, improvement contributions are coming from. Uh, so comparing the relative contributions to improvements in private AMS over just a single baseline model, the majority of the improvement is coming from ensembling. First place solution was already using that. So what my solution is uh, really benefiting from is the state augmentation. That provides uh, almost a third of the overall improvement. The swish activation function, the dense connections, they provide modulus improvements. And then we have this one cycle that then halves uh, the required training time. So just to summarize, um, what we've seen at the of these algorithms, they really can be improved by staying up to date with the field of deep learning. Uh, the study showed that uh, these new methods, they bring genuine benefits uh, in, terms of, in terms of single model performance. Uh, they can reduce the overall training time and the application time, and also, uh, more importantly, reduce the hardware, the hardware that is required. So we can actually have uh, final, state, uh, final stage analyzers just computing uh, training and running very powerful algorithms just on their laptop CPU. In all the solutions that I developed, um, these were implemented in Lumen. Lumen is a PyTorch wrapper uh, that I developed. Um, there's also a link to the study codes here, so you can actually try it out yourselves. And then also a link to, uh, to the paper there as well. So um, thank you very much for listening, and I'd like to open the floor to any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Gilles. Very interesting talk. Now we can move to the question. No one has a question. Graham. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, who couldn't find his unmute button? Yeah, he, that was a really nice talk. I was interested um, at how much of a difference the data augmentation makes, because if I understood correctly, that actually increases the amount of data that you're training against. So would that not mean that naively you're thinking, well, I've got more data to train against, so that should increase the training time? What am I missing? Uh, yes, in, indeed, it did um, increase the training time. Uh, fairly considerably. Actually, um, sorry, I'll just uh, share again. Okay. Um, and to actually have the, uh, my, I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, training time. 
So when we add in the data augmentation, this is this line here. So taking, yeah, um, 10 entity TI to this purple line. So yeah, um, it almost doubles uh, the required training time. Um, but as I say, the benefits in performance from having more data to train on uh, meant that, it, in my opinion, um, it was worth uh, doing the data augmentation. The data fixing, that was, um, this is where you apply a common alignment to all the events. This was obviously uh, much quicker to run. However, then you couldn't do the test time augmentation. Uh, and yeah, the performance was also better without uh, test time augmentation, simply from having more data. Ideally, I think the performance should be the same um, in training time because you're effectively just removing symmetries that the network would otherwise have to learn. Um, but you do get this effect of regularization through data complexity, basically because you're deliberately not um, removing some complexity from the data. So possibly this could be evened out uh, by adjusting in some of the hyperparameters for explicit regularization. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Stefan? Um, I would actually, to concerning what Graham said, um, probably the analysis, uh, they would be happy to have data augmentation because the, the overfitting problem and then the, the tuning you have to do uh, to avoid overfitting, that is, um, that is annoying. But what I wanted to ask is, um, is this difficult to set up? Because I think the analyzers would trade 10% uh, loss in performance against, um, I don't know, being able to set it up 10 times faster. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as I say, there's this Lumen package um, of been, yeah, that's been public now for one and a half years. Uh, it's actually being, well, I'm using it in a CMS analysis. And what we're doing is we're exporting the models in TensorFlow uh, or Onyx, via, Onyx then into TensorFlow. And then run it, um, at inference time, it's being run via the CMS SW plugins to TensorFlow. So effectively, our, our training is detached from our inference environment. So yes, um, it can be quick to set up, provided you're already familiar with the package. Um, of course, the yeah, one of the difficulties is if you want to do the test time augmentation. So this is running data augmentation at inference time. That obviously takes that could take a a long time, uh, especially if you're having to rerun. Um, due to systematic vari uh, variations of each data point. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, there are no other questions. No more questions. We can thank uh, Jill uh, again. And uh, we move uh, to we can move to the last uh, talk of this uh, first part of the session. This talk will be given by Axel, uh, who will explain us uh, the latest uh, development in the route. Yeah, Hello, everyone, if you can hear. Yes. Well, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I appreciate it. I think I, that's the first time ever that route is at iChip. I remember correctly, if I studied correctly. So uh, it's, it's something special for us. So let me tell you what's special. I hope you can see the slides now. Um, what route is that to? Um, that's what I'm going to present in the next 20 minutes. It's not 20 or 90 past, right? Just to, to make sure we keep track. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if it is my, uh, it is my problem, but I, your audio, it's a bit uh, chopped. I don't know if uh, other people have the same problem. Yeah, we also have the same problem. So uh, maybe if you can uh, try by switching off uh, the, the video. Thank you. Okay, let's try without video. I, Probably it's not going to help. I'm at CERN and the network here is 
reasonable usually. So anyway, um, so I have to remind you what uh, what root is used for, um, and that sort of extends to its vision. And I'll explain where we are uh, on that road, and then I'll conclude. Now to use root, it's a centerpiece of high physics. Virtually every high physicist is using root for analysis in some way or another. There are now one exabyte data format up, and um, it defines sort of the the common language, the graphics language, but also when we talk filling history and so on. That's where it's from. It's uh, older than that. Um, you get the idea. Uh, common software allows us to the common language. It allows us to have a data format. And so common grounds, if you move from one experiment to another, then you can understand what they're up to uh, software-wise, analysis-wise. It's coherently designed. The different parts are aware of uh, each other and allows us to have an optimized play. For example, the IO is sort of at the foundation of everything and uh, things are trying to be optimal with respect to the IO. Um, the core of root is in C++, but it has dynamic Python bindings giving access to all its interfaces. And these bindings are not only used for root, whenever you use Python, say with experiments frameworks, then very often it's Python things that uh, work there. Now compared to 25 years ago, nowadays there is uh, a large alternative um, market sort of, of open source big data software out there. Uh, it's production grade and much of that is explored in high energy physics um, or used even. In many aspects, though, big data processing isn't 100% the same as a physics analysis. For example, I'm still aware that the analysis be decoded by somebody who really know how to code for a certain interface. Um, it's a question of usability, of efficiency, which in turn, by the way, it's not just CPU efficiency or money efficiency, but it's also a question of uh, efficiency when it comes to energy. Um, so I think sustainability plays a role here. Data delivery uh, is, is very specific in ING physics with x uh, and, and us and so on. And there's a question of setup cost, the fact that our data is event-based uh, with typically independent events that we can't data point, these kind of things are different. On the other hand, some can certainly be nicely adapted, for example, for machine learning while others need some considerable integration effort. So reusing things that are out there isn't necessarily free. It might mean that we still end up with some um, software that we need to maintain ourselves in ING physics. So that brings me to why you might want to bet on root also for the future. The reason is, of course, that it's targeted for ING physics. Um, we were aiming at some efficient support for ING physics policies. We sort of know what's happening out there, what people need, so that we can adapt and, and uh, we can commonly benefit from solutions and R&D that are tailored to high physics problems. I know it's very abstract, but I'll show you what this concretely means in a couple of slides. Obviously, we are nonetheless facing with learning from other tools, so we are not living in isolation here. And uh, Root gives you a single point of improvement. If you contribute here, then uh, you have an impact for Basically, experiments, be it uh, for, for offline works, reconstruction, or for data analysis. Um, the advantage really is that it's community driven. Uh, we, the community knows its own challenges, and you get a coherent, reliable, performant, and agreed solution. If something is wrong, then people know where to complain to, uh, sometimes through the experiments or whatever, and then we can fix it ourselves within the community. That's a big advantage. Now, who is we? Um, the, the team, that's the core team. Those are the people who are, for example, attending the, the meetings. Um, but we have many more contributors that are sending in patches or ideas and people who are working part time on it listed here. As you can see, CERN is one of the main um, uh, contributors. We also have um, contributors from many other um, institutions. So it's, it, it's out there. Any of the part contributors are actually um, not it. Talk about these contributors. 
can see on the top right plot the contributors per month. Um, it's now sort of stable at 40, uh, 30. Uh, I was a bit scared that it would be increasing, ever increasing. <laughs> not sustainable um, but uh, we have a large number of uh, of contributors even until recent history the commits per month are also fairly stable so it's a sustainable thing um, we we evolve and it's active talking about active support is one of the key ingredients of our work for anybody who's working on route the main platform we use is, uh, is at, at the forum.cern.ch, uh, a web forum. Um, here I plot the number of messages, support messages uh, since many years. Um, that's combining both the mailing list that we used in the past and the forum that we use now. And you can see that we are now, luckily, plateauing at 14,000 <laughs> messages per year, which is a really high number. It means 56 messages per workday. Um, so yeah, that's, that's uh, I think, an important ingredient of Root. Now, given all this, what does this mean? And I think the message we've learned from the last 20 years, maybe, um, is, is something that Steve Jobs has nicely put into one sentence. So let me just read this out loud. People think focus means saying yes to the things you've got to focus on, but that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to the hundred other good ideas that are have to be careful. And so we've done our picking and we have started a massive multi-year development effort um, a couple of years ago. So we are now a good path down the road focusing on a couple of main columns um, that are part of Root. So there is the general analysis part where we are focusing on parallelism, Python interfaces, our data frame, Rufit, and TMDA. You might not know our data frame. I'll get into that in a couple of slides. We are working on a T3 successor. Ooh. Uh, we are replacing the graphic system, and we're uh, working on a new generation of the histograms. Now, why are we working on those? Um, we believe that they are most relevant for physicists. They allow physicists and, and thus you to save most time. So they have basically the biggest effect uh, given our development time. Um, they also allow us to have a core set of features that again share a, a consistent design. So basically like the T-object pointer that you're used to with, with the old route, um, but no only in, in a 2020s uh, style of interfaces. If I were to draw this, then root IO remains at the basis of everything. So we are trying to make things as efficient as possible given root IO with big data pipes into Rufit, into our data frame, and into TMVA, which can then fan out data for training or inference uh, into whatever machine learning tool you would like to use. And all of that has a layer of PyRoot on top that is partially automatic and partially handcrafted however we, we find uh, whatever we find more suitable. Now, of course, you're asking what of that can actually be used today. I'll show you how we are. There are some things that you can experiment with. We've put those into a namespace called root experimental. And part of that are, for example, the new graphics painters, uh, the new GUI system, um, where you see a screenshot here, you can just start this with root dash dash web if you have a build with these features enabled. And there is Eve, the new event display that's used by EMS. Uh, I hope you see this multi spot connection. You can see it's the web application, it's communicating with root um, if needed across the network. Uh, it's using GL uh, in whatever shape or form. We don't care because luckily we're using browser interfaces, so we don't need to be system specific anymore with these things. Our hist is ongoing. That's the replacement of TH12 and so on. Um, we, the, the goals are to simplify the interfaces. We want to have less documentation for you to sift through to find the feature that you need. For example, simple things like making only 2D methods available for the uh, 2D histogram. We are separating data from graphics, sort of the obvious things that, that one would want to do uh, when revisiting histograms. 
We also want to make them more usable, um, for example, to have re access definition for multiple histograms. We want to be able to have circular axes, uh, the good old modulo to pi, you know, if you subtract to, uh, to jet phi's and you need to figure out how to fill that into the histogram, that's always fun. Um, we want counting axes uh, where you don't have to worry that you fill with 3.999 and so it ends up in the wrong bin, but instead we just count and, and have say four, four jets. And obviously that's not going to be slower than the old ones. Sorry, you have five minutes left. Thank you. <laughs> then we are, we are we're working on a T3 replacement. Uh, there is an article that explains why energy physics is using T3, uh, simply because it's the fastest for our kind of data. Now our end tuple is much faster than that even. Here's a nice plot that shows the, the factor of uh, speed improvement for a regular analysis where you read data from SSD. We are optimizing this for the current use cases, uh, for example, tweaking, compression, and parallel I.O. We're making it simpler and sturdier to use. But actually, likely you shouldn't be using that at all. Likely that should be in implementation detail, data stored in uh, our tuple format. But instead, we provide a new interface that allows you to write analyses independently of the actual file format. And that's called our data frame. It's out there since 2018. It's um, highly efficient for T3 and RN tuple analyses. It's compact modular and it's using declarative code. Uh, so you don't need to set up the branch address, tell us which branches you read. You don't have to write down the loop. All of that is done uh, automatically behind the scene. And the code you write is extremely similar for C++ and Python have some one tutorials that allow you to look at it. And it's not just a gimmick. This has been used in analyses. There is a CERN EP software seminar that shows uh, one of its applications and how well it works. So if you don't know our data frame, I would certainly recommend that you look at the tutorials to, uh, to see how it works. Here's just a small teaser. Um, so you define your data set that you want to run this in parallel. Um, then you filter which events you want to look at. You can define new variables. And you can some things, also write things out as selected or whatnot into a new root file. TMVA has uh, several new features since uh, 620. For example, well, those are older, the, uh, the adapters to backends like TensorFlow and Keras and Scikit-Learn. Um, but then there's also a QDNN and C++ jitting uh, to get highest performance also for boosted decision trees. Um, we have better NumPy integration and because all of this is fairly descriptive, not very practical, I gave you a link to a talk which explains with code how to use these new features. We have a new private root in 6.2020, which allows you to use C++ lambdas and move semantics so that things become way more efficient. Um, it allows us to have uh, Pythonizations extensible for a new C++ code. And we now have root built for both C uh, Python 2 and 3 at the same time, so you don't need to select the root build based on which Python you want to use anymore. Roofit, I don't have to cover this. Right after this presentation, there's Stefan's talk. Um, which will deep dive, but in case you wonder whether you should listen, you see the plot with factors of speed up, so I think you do want to listen to that. Let me conclude. Root is really back to the future in some sense. In the 90s, Root started by, need, by having to prove itself against alternatives, and we're sort of back in that situation, and we accept that challenge. We want to deliver a simpler, friendlier, more robust Root, uh, trying to address the real issues of physicists in a relevant and applicable way. Um, now, how do we do this and how do we know that that's working out? We have prototypes as those that I showed you. Um, we're soliciting early feedback, so please try them out. Please tell us what's nice for you and what doesn't work, what we should be investing more work in. There's lots of work ongoing, actually, and it's all for you. So please keep an eye on root.cern, where we announce and blog posts and so on. Uh, the new features and what we're working on. Now, root is not MS Word, okay? It's not there for you to download and use and curse at it. It's, it's a community thing. I mean, high energy physics itself is evolving root. 
So you can have a say in what you like and what you dislike. If you see a bug, please report it so that we can get it fixed. Or even better, if you have that fixed, please hand it in so everybody can get it. If you're in something that is complained, that's really the only way that we can move forward. And it teaches us what we should focus on with the new evolutions. So right now, this is really crucial for us to hear. And of course, praise also works really well. Um, yeah. <laughs> if there's anything you like, please let us know. And if you wonder how to contact us, here are several of the options. Um, and that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, very useful. Uh, uh, thank you very much also for all the links you provided to example and uh, tutorial. So uh, Elisa has already raised her hand, so please uh, go ahead. Okay, yes. Um, well, I do wanna praise you. I think that all of this work is uh, great for the community and I'm glad that you're taking a fresh look to, to see uh, what, what would be benefiting us. I do want to ask from your second to less bullet um, to the complaint part is something we've been complaining about for a while and you didn't really mention it. And that is, um, you know, the concurrency friendliness of root. Um, are these new classes that you've gone through all, um, you know, thread safe? Yeah, absolutely. So they they have two properties. Um, they are, they're using a Look at our end tuple example. That's using um, multi-threading under the hood uh, as much as possible. So it's trying to expose this to the frameworks, but it's trying to hide it from physicists. So there's always some some nice uh, jackaling because the folks want to know something's happening. But physicists are happy if we can use our cores at least for the moment and we can make use of them and accelerate the analysis. So that's done for our end tuple. If you look at our hist, for example, that's simply just a thread safe thing. I mean, there, it's like a spectre, right? You don't want to post it from current thread. It's a container, it behaves like you would expect. So that's certainly something that, that we are taking into account. Okay, thanks. So is it possible then that we could, you know, from the framework side, just try some of these things and see, um, and, and gain those uh, that scaling of the root I/O that we've been looking for. Would you say that that's possible now? Yeah, absolutely. So we're in contact actually with uh, with the CMS work people, uh, Mati and and um, uh, uh, and and colleagues to okay. uh, to try out the RN table prototype in the context of CMS. Um, so that's ongoing. Um, yes. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, Ashraf. Uh, yes, I I just have a one quick question uh, regarding to the uh, already existing methods like T three uh, and T three draw and so on. So I'm using T three draw, and uh, the thing is um, maybe some work needed in the memory optimization of the tree readout uh, because, for example, if I have a big sample or big data set and use T3 draw, for example, for instance, it takes, it occupies all the memory uh, at once. So I think um, there are, um, I think you have, you need to keep an eye on the memory optimization for the um, already implemented classes somehow. Yeah, so we are certainly fixing bugs and that sounds like one. Um, Principal T3 draw is uh, one of the most uh, used interfaces of root, I would say. Uh, so I'm very surprised to hear that there is uh, that you see an issue. I bet it's actually more of the file format that is causing problems. Um, so I would appreciate if you could just uh, drop a note on uh, on the forum, uh, ideally maybe with the link to the file that you're using and then we can have a look at it. Okay, thanks. So there is time for the one more last question from Ken. Oh yeah, just wondering uh, how long you were planning to support Python 2. That's an excellent question and I don't know the answer. Uh, we're not going to support if any of the experiments is still using Python 2 in production. Um, I mean, not the for 
to uh, you know view the experiments to migrate away from Python three uh, to from Python two. So we all support it for as long as as needed. I do expect that Python two is sort of frozen. Uh, some features might only get available in Python three, but uh, we are not gonna we are not gonna drop Python two in the foreseeable future. There's nothing planned. Okay, I saw another question. If it is very short, uh, otherwise, uh, okay, if it, if it is very short, we can go ahead. Otherwise, uh, we have to move to, to the mattermost. Okay, thank you. It is going to be very uh, short. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Uh, Alex, uh, in what way does these R N2 pools are different from the regular N2 pools? Like, you no, know, they need to go uh, another layer of uh, processing uh, this N2 pools to get the R N2 pools? I had a hard time hearing you. Stopped and again being a computer. Um, I will just take a guess at what you asked. And if I was wrong, uh, I'm hanging out in Mattermost, so you can just ask your questions there. That's valid for everybody, of course. Um, in, in the in the this tracks channel is where I'm hanging out, right? Um, so we're planning to hide a migration tool from trees to our tuples, so that you can fit from from the improvements. Our end um, That's an obvious feature that we are going to support, similar to Ed, um, just transferring the data. Yeah. And that should okay. be done by probably fall this year, actually. So it's like that's planned being worked on. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much again, uh, Axel, for your talk. Now uh, we have uh, our first uh, coffee break. We are a little bit late on time. We can try to shorten a little bit uh, the coffee break and uh, reconvene to five minutes to five. And uh, as I said before, uh, this time uh, can be used for uh, free discussion uh, uh, among, uh, among people. So see you in uh, 15 minutes. Um, who asked the question about tea tree draw? Somebody who's having coffee, maybe. Hi, I'm sorry. It looks like everybody really went for coffee. So probably you will have to wait a bit. Well, you know, I'll just write it in the MetaMouse channel and uh, then we'll see if uh, the person sees it. Okay. I think it was Ashraf Mohammed. I think. I'm not sure, but I think I saw his microphone on, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it was him. We'll just wait. Kiara, is that you? Kiara Yes. Hi, hi, nice That's to hear you. Yes, yeah. it's me. Very nice to hear you. Yeah, yeah, thank you.
Hello, are you back from the coffee break? I am. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I guess we probably have to wait a minute, some, some more minutes. I'll start sharing. Perfect, thank you. Yep, I'm here. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So um, I am now taking over from Elisabetta. My name is Dagmar and I will chair this part of this afternoon session. I don't know, uh, what do you think, Stefan? Should we wait? <laughs> it's, um, I don't care, so we can, we can wait a bit. Um to give people some time to come back, yes. Okay, so let's wait like to 17 hours. Depends on the, on the schedule. I don't know if we're packed or not. Um, not really. Um, in addition, one of the speakers, uh, Mrs. Uh, Irene Dutta is still not connected, so probably mm -hmm. we will have to skip one talk. Ah, now she's connected, okay. Good. So we are complete now. Okay, let's start. Okay. So could you, could you please uh, uh, start? The room is yours. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm here to report a bit about what happened in Rufit in the last uh, time. So um, just to set the stage a bit, Rufit is a package for statistical analysis. So you can write fit models and then you can fit them to data. And then we have RuStats, which is on top of Rufit, and you can use this to do statistical analysis. And this is used in almost all experiments in high energy physics. Um, and Rufit was developed about 2005 uh, to up to 2011. I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer if I mark these things. Uh, if not, you can complain. Uh, and in recent years, it didn't change much. So end of 2018, I joined the SFT group at CERN to resume the development in Rufit. And then obviously I was facing a couple of challenges. So we have old interfaces and uh, a couple of old bugs that are around then the communication with the users is actually a big challenge because I don't know what the users need. And this is also why I'm here today. And then obviously what we always want is speed. So we're expecting more data. And uh, if we have more data, we want to do fits with more complexity. So we have higher statistics so we can write more complex fit models. So my goal was to reach a significant speed up of proof it, something like five times in a single thread. Um, and um, so let's go a bit into details what happened in the last year. Um, in October 2018, I found Rufit with 200 bucks uh, being tracked and 15 improvements. So some of these bugs, they were super annoying. Something like uh, you, you run Rufit, you plot a, um, a histogram, and then when you type .q in the root interpreter, it crashed. Or we were not able to open root 5 workspaces due to some file system evolution uh, in root 6. So we couldn't reopen the Higgs discovery, for example. And these things, I had to get them out of the way. So this is when I joined. And here you see on this plot, the, uh, the line that is green says um, which, which kind of issues have been closed. And the red line is issues that have been opened. So Rufit is one of the few projects in high energy physics where this green line is actually rising faster than the red line. So today we have 74 bucks being tracked and 30 improvements. And you see from the number of improvements, there's quite some ideas around how we could improve Rufit. Um, so for these old bugs, sometimes they might not even be relevant. They might even be fixed and I didn't have time to look into this. So if you have something which is relevant, which has high priority, you can actually go to Rufit's Jira and vote because that will help us to, to judge what is, what is important for you, for the users. And now let's go a bit into um, interfaces, collections and usabilities because that is also something which is a bit weird in Rufit. Uh, at some points you use these collections, which are called arc set and arc list. These are basically collections to pass parameters or observables and something uh, around in Rufit. And you can, for example, query the parameters of a PDF. And then you have to write this weird code here at the side. 
um, this is the old roof fit which I had, uh, which I found in Route 616. So you see these iterators, they're super clumsy and the access is also slow. And this is because they were based on a linked list that is from a really early stage when roof fit was developed. And then I changed this and based them on a standard vector. And you don't have to update the old code. You can still use these funny clumsy iterators, but what you write today is you write a range based for loop over parameters and then you just print them. So you can do this in C++, you can do this in Python. I will also come to why this works in Python. And uh, now we have shorter, more readable code, and this iterates 25% faster than the old loops in Rufit. So typical workflows, when you just look at the tutorial in Rufit, they are between three and 21% faster. That depends on how much iteration they are doing. So let's have a look now into Python. You, Axel mentioned this, we have PyRoot, which generates automatic Python bindings. So if we have something on the C++ side, we can access this on the Python side and these, are, these bindings, they're generated automatically. So if this was the old Python code that you wrote to iterate through something, uh, this is what you write now in Python, because if Python finds an STL-like C++ interface, it automatically generates the bindings to do this loop here in Python. So this is super amazing, and this makes using Rufit a lot, uh, a lot um, easier. But in addition to the automatic bindings, we also have something which we call Pythonizations. So this is short Python code that steers the C++ backend and rewrite it if, we're, if uh, we find that something from the automatic bindings just doesn't work. For example, there's an object, the workspace in Rufit, and it has the method import. But in Python, you can't use this because import is a reserved keyword. So what we do is we write a Python Pythonization that just defines this import with capital I, and that redirects internally to this import that you have to retrieve with the get attribute function. So you can just use it. Or collection.size becomes length of collection. And then we wanted to do even more. So Rufit has these command arguments. So you can use them to steer what Rufit does, for example, fits or so. And in Python, the most logical thing to do would be to say, OK, the range is the sideband. So you, then Rufit would only fit in the range. But um, we had a summer student project already approved for this, but then COVID-19 came and we couldn't run the summer student programs. So I'm super confident that we can advertise the summer student project again. And then next year, we're going to get even more nice uh, Python bindings. So if you have requests, if you find some of the interfaces clumsy, you can just request them as an improvement on Rufit's Jira. Um, something more about interfaces. Some people had to use categories. And categories in old Rufit, they were based on something which is called Rue cut type. It's a class. And this uh, consisted of 256 characters and an integer. And um, this thing I replaced just by an integer because an, a category is, in essence, just a number. And the number has also a state name. So this is logical to represent this as an integer. And this has several advantages. So the first thing is, it uses less memory. This old root cut type was wasting 288 bytes, and now the integer is only four bytes. And if you put this in a data set and you have 1 million entries, then you're saving 1 million times 284 bytes. This gets compressed a bit, but still it's a, it's a, it's a saving. And then for computations, Rufit has to pass this thing around. And passing around an integer is much better than this, this cut type here. Um, and then obviously, if I update the categories, I also update the interface. So if you want to iterate through the states of a category, you just do this with the range based for loop now. And I want to stress again, we don't have to update old code. So we try to have everything compatible with the old code. This will, this stuff here in the, in the middle, sorry, this here will still work, but this here will be faster and obviously easier to use. Um, something for Rufit experts who write their own PDFs. Uh, this is something you usually don't use. It's inside Rufit, but some people write their own PDFs. Um, in the old Rufit, when you wanted to access a different object, let's say you are some, writing a Gaussian distribution and you need uh, access to the width or the sigma parameter of the distribution, what you needed was the real proxy. So it's a, it's a handle to a different object. And these proxies, they could store everything. So to retrieve something from the object, you had to retrieve the thing, then you had to cast. Maybe you had to write some checking code because you never know what users can store on this thing. And then you could invoke the function that you actually are interested in. And in root 672, you can type the proxies. If you say, mathematically, I can only ever make sense of a PDF, then you say, I want a PDF or something which is derived from a PDF. And then you just invoke PDF fit to and Rufit will do the rest. So you don't have to cast. 
this is something which uh, is interesting for people who are working on the inside of Rufit. A bit more, um, I asked around uh, on, on a workshop what LSCB, for example, needs from Rufit. And they, they told me what they're missing is the Johnson PDF. So the Johnson is this thing here. Uh, they were passing this around as a string. And funny enough, there's a typo here. There's a factor two missing, but that was never a problem because Rufit automatically computes the normalization of functions. So this factor two was just getting normalized away. Um, but now, instead of writing this, you just write Rue Johnson and you get what you need. So it's faster. It can check its own parameters. For example, the delta here, it cannot be negative. So if you say, I want a delta that has the value two, and it can vary between minus one, minus one and 10, then Rupert will tell you, sorry, but delta should never be negative. I advise you to change the range. Um, you get more accurate analytic integrals. And um, it's in general, it's just easier to use these built-in PDFs. So if you have something which you think should be Rufit, because a lot of groups are using this, then please get in touch. There's also the new, the Hypathia distribution, which is uh, also something that LSCB uses. And now I wanna come to uh, speed because that's something everybody likes. Um, I will have to go into quickly into how Rufit computes. So if you want to compute a likelihood function, then you have an expression tree that is like, it's a, it's a PDF or some is a sum of multiple PDFs and so on. And these can be um, represented as such a tree. And if you evaluate this tree, what you get is a probability. And you have to compute this probability for every data point in your data sample. So what Rufit does to achieve this, it loads a single data point into a variable. And then it evaluates this whole expression tree, gets a single probability. Then it loads the next data point into the variable. And then it evaluates the whole expression tree again. And that goes in a loop until you have all the probabilities. And this is super inefficient for modern computers. So I did some simple profiling. And I found 50% level one or two cache misses if you load the data like this. So I will go a bit into detail, for example, how a Gaussian distribution gets its data. In old Rufit, the Gaussian looks like this. You have X minus mean, and then you have some sigma, and then you, do, you compute the exponential. And these objects, X mean and sigma, they're really objects and they have virtual functions that you call to retrieve the value. So that means you have uh, already four function calls to just compute a single double the probability of a Gaussian distribution. And in Rufit, uh, no, sorry, in Rufit 620, I reorganized the data access completely. So now you have one function that calls into this X, but it gets all the values of X in the entire data set as an array. It gets all the values of U and all the values of sigma. And then it runs this computation here. It runs this in a loop for all, um, for all entries in the data set. And then with four function calls, you have the entire probabilities of this Gaussian distribution for every event in your data set. And that is that can give a considerable speed up. And in addition, if you have data in arrays, you can use vectorization, so uh, signal instruction multiple data. So if you have contiguous arrays and you want to compute, for example, X minus mu, then with modern CPUs with large floating point units, you can, for example, if you have AVX, or AVX2, you can compute four of these values at a time. With AVX512, you can even compute eight. So um, you can theoretically get a speed up of factor four to a factor eight if you use this vectorization. The caveat with this is you need to compile this for a specific architecture. So you need to recompile and then give the compiler flag architecture native or AVX2 or AVX512 or something. And then in addition, Rufit is, has some, some magic weapon. It's the VDT library. And that is a library that has fast, inlineable, vectorizable math functions, so exponentials and logarithms and so on. And these are even faster in the, than the standard library functions. And the result of this work is um, here in this, in this plot. So the baseline is just the factor one. That's the old Rufit uh, computation strategy. And then if you use the batch computations, you get speed ups between factor three up to factor 16. And that varies on depending on the hardware you have, the CPUs you have, the compiler you have. But anyway, you see that you get, um, there's a lot of opportunities. And I was just wanna show um, here a little demo. I have a notebook on Swan, the service for web-based analysis. And I will just uh, run all cells now and explain what this thing is doing. So it's computing a Gaussian distribution with the parameters mean and sigma and a Bernstein polynomial with five uh, parameters. And here it's just defining the background model. That's the Bernstein. Here it's the signal model. That's the Gaussian. Then it's creating a sum of those two, saving the initial parameters. So you, you can always go back. 
it's generating 1 million events, and then it's fitting this model to the data. So model fit to data set. And that's the old rule fit strategy, and this is still running. So you see there's uh, the minimization is running, it's, it's estimating the parameters. And then when this completes, it will also run the same uh, computation, but it will switch on the new batch mode. So the thing that I just told you about, this optimize here will go away in the next root version. You can ignore this for now. Uh, now we're already estimating the matrix of second derivatives. So that's, uh, that's the correlation coefficients and so on. So this completed in 48 seconds. And now the new workflow is running and you never know what you get. This completed in seven seconds. So this is a shared machine. I'm sharing this with other users. So these numbers, they vary a bit, but you see by just switching on this single argument and then this one here that you will need in the next root version, you get a nice speed up. And the nice thing also is look at the correlation coefficients. For example, you get exactly the same value and the same holds for the parameters. So uh, the model that you have here, you see here, it's, um, it's just a background that has a signal peak. And then you can see that this was nicely uh, captured by the fit. So I'll go back to the slides. Um, I'll give you a little outlook on things that are still to come. So these bin fits, uh, no, sorry, but what I just told you about the, the batch computation, so far this is uh, implemented for unbinned likelihood fits. But obviously you can also apply this to bin fits, for example, the HISP factory, that's what Atlas uses for, for their statistical models. And they're not yet supporting this, but uh, I expect a significant speed up if the batch computations are also running for the bin fits. And that's something I'm working on. And then we have a second thing, uh, GPUs. They're a very hot topic. So we also want to try woof on GPUs. And for this, you have to basically do three things. You have to redesign the data structures such that you find the data in arrays. And this is something I have already done already for these batch computations. Then you have to change the computation kernels. And this is kind of done because the computation kernels I wrote for, um, for this vectorizable math, they're very similar to GPU kernels. If you just replace this for loop by uh, index computation, what this kernel should work on, then this is almost a GPU kernel. And then it needs infrastructure to submit the kernels and collect the results. This is not something we have at the moment, but we have a technical student starting in September and his task will be to do exactly that. So I'm fairly confident that in, I don't know, half a year or a year from now, we will have some nice uh, things to show how Rufit works or GPUs. So this is a timeline of all that happened um, with Rufit and Sorry. you saw Sorry. most of this. Sorry. Okay, Sorry. I'll, like yeah, I'll wrap up. Okay, um, so what you saw, I think, in this talk is I want to make Rufit faster, easier to use, and more stable. And this is what we're going to work on, and you can direct our attention. So if you have something that is interesting for you, then please let us know. And please check out the tutorials. They are amazing. And check out the release notes. We always keep you up to date what's happening. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot for very interesting and educative talk. And now uh, we can have some questions. Yeah, I would. Do you want to uh, call oh. the people? Yes, 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 I will. Uh, it's uh, no, no, it's Kamel or no, mm. Kevin. Kevin, sorry, sorry, sorry. So please, Kevin. Hi, uh, Stefan. Thanks for mm -hmm. uh, presenting this information. It's really great to see the uh, computational improvements that are going on in Rufit. Um, I have to go back, though, to the, the issue of uh, the many open issues on JIRA. And unfortunately, some of these are much more serious than the computational performance. They actually affect the statistical validity of the results from Rufit. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one particular issue that's been open for many years and has not been addressed. In fact, it was open in 2011. Um, and this is the use of approximations in the bin likelihood fit causing biases. Uh, okay. the, the difference between uh, evaluating functions at the bin center versus using the integral and uh, that this is not done consistently. And okay. this is a, an issue that frequently affects many physics analyses and causes months of work to be lost. Okay, so that is uh, very this good. This really to, needs to be addressed. Yeah. It's, uh, it's good that you mentioned this. Actually, this is something we want to work on. So these batch computations, they would allow to kind of compute an integral. So if you evaluate the, the PDF only at the bin center, 
you're making a mistake if the second derivative is large. You're absolutely right. And this would allow this batch computations, this interface would allow to do this more accurately, to kind of run a numeric integral, so to some trapezoids inside the bin to get a better approximation. So it's good that you mentioned this. I'll bump this up in the priority list. I'll post the issue link in the chat here. Um, I'm not okay. in the Dynamo right now, but I could go there as well. But just Thanks. to be clear, this isn't just a matter of using the integral versus the bin central, though I do agree having the ability to use the integral everywhere would be the best solution. Mm -hmm. But the problem here is that sometimes the bin center is used and sometimes the integral is used in the same computation. And that's what introduces okay. the bias. Um, so the Good. consistency is important. And then of course, using the integral would be even better if it can be done efficiently. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thanks. Yeah. Thanks to you. Okay, uh, now Liz, please. Yeah, I was really impressed by your uh, demo and your bravery for doing it online. Um, <laughs> I was wondering though, um, how does the notebook know um, how much concur, you know, what vectorization to use. Um, you know, you mentioned that it sort of depends on how you've compiled the thing, but um, was it in some phase prior to this that you set up the right library to attach to your notebook or what no. happened here? In okay. this case, it doesn't use any vectorization at all. So um, ah, we don't okay. distribute root on uh, CVMFS with vectorization. Um, the speed up here is in more efficient data loading in better cache utilization and also in uh, more efficient error checking. So for example, if you, um, if you run into not a numbers or infinities, um, the old method will run into these infinities and not a number one million times and the new method will only do it once. So that's why it's so much faster. Um, if we had vectorizations, we would probably get the seven seconds down to something like one or two seconds but um, we can't put root with vectorization enabled into CVMFS because then it would crash on some CPUs that don't have this. I see, but if somebody were doing this on their laptop and they knew exactly what uh, chip they had, they could compile it specially for- Absolutely. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. So you put architect to native and you get the best what, you, what your CPU supports. Mm -hmm. Nice, thank you. Okay, is there any other question to Stefan? I don't see any, so let's proceed to the next talk, which is by Andrea De Luca, and it's about uh, automated selection of particle jet features for data analysis in head experiments. So Luca, the room is yours. Thanks, Please. can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, thank you. So I'm Andrea, PhD students in physics at University of Trento and Fondazione Bruno Kessler. And today we'll show some results, some ongoing study on automated selection of particle jet feature for data analysis. So before going into the details of the study, let me just introduce the problem. So when dealing with a new classification problem, in which we are going to use some machine learning techniques, one crucial, crucial step is the feature selection. One key point we always keep in mind when, producing, when selecting features or produce, and producing new data set is that we must try to reduce the unnecessary dimensionality. There are many reasons to do that. The first is time constraints. So the larger will be the information we want to teach to our model, the longer will be the training time. Then there is also a matter of sample size. Indeed, as you know, some Monte Carlo simulation could be very time consuming. So using too wide model to, um, to learn from this limited sample could not allow the model to generalize pretty well. And then there is some understanding uh, point that is particularly true, relevant when dealing with the neural network. That, uh, that try to solve this high dimensional problem and very often it's not clear what is going on when they're working. So here we, uh, we start to think about a possible approach to select the most relevant feature. And to do that, we take the most relevant features non-correlated as ranked by a decision tree algorithm. So you see here the main steps uh, to 
to produce our final model. So we start from preliminary steps. Then we retrieve the feature ranking from the, the GSIN3 algorithm. Then we move to the correlated variable removal and we are ready to train our final model, model and deploy it. Concerning the preliminary steps, uh, we start producing our main data set. So we have to store all the variable we want to test, then apply, apply some selection to clean the data from uh, noise and other undesired features. Then if we are dealing with a classification problem, we should populate each class equally. And depending on which task we are trying to solve, there are other many stuff that one can do. For example, the scaling of the variable in a limited range is always a suggested item. And to do that, there are some standard scaler or minimal scaler provided by scikit-learn. Then after we have our main data set, we can start optimizing our decision tree algorithm in order to get the best feature ranking from itself. You can see the here this snippet in which we define some grid, uh, grid search, uh, uh, randomized grid search for our catboots, uh, for our catboots model. Okay, so when we are our, uh, our decision tree algorithm train, we are ready to retrieve the feature ranking. This tool is very nice because it help us and it could help us in the future to um, tackle some high energy physics challenges when dealing with uh, large entities. So to, to understand if some variable are really relevant or not. Here I show you two different algorithms that are CatBoost and Random Forest. CatBoost is, was deployed in 2017, I think by Yandex and it uses gradient boosting on the decision tree. And it's pretty nice because it supports GPU training, while Random Forest is an ensemble learning method that at training time evaluates a multiple uh, number of, uh, of single trees. And then the output of our model will be the mean or, uh, uh, or the mode of the individual trees, depending on which task we are trying to solve. We were interested to see if different algorithm uh, provided some ranking that were similar somehow. Then we start, remove, after we have a, a, a feature ranking, we are ready to remove in a single way the correlated variable. So we start from the first ranked variable and we start looking to uh, the correlation with all the other variables and we iterate the processes to the remaining, the survived vari variables. Removing correlated variables is quite a crucial step since it allows to uh, clean our, uh, <clears throat> our data set from some undesired noise. So our prediction could be, uh, let's say more, more precise and it also will improve the significance of the prediction. Okay, so these are the, all the steps uh, to produce uh, to select the feature and produce the data set. Now I will show you a benchmark application. So we decided to um, focus on the boosted X that came to a pair of big quark. As you know, uh, the X boson decay in a pair of big quarks uh, almost 60% of times. So it, it's may, maybe the best channel where to study the X boson properties. But if you are collecting data from the X boson decay at the proton, proton collider, as you know, uh, there is a huge irreducible background coming from QGD multi-jet production. You can see here the cross section for the X boson production and the other processes. And you see that there are some order of mag magnitude of difference. So it is a challenging task. Then we choose the boosted regime, since it's a nice place where to look for beyond standard model effects. You can see here uh, the X, the X transverse momentum spectrum. Uh, st the standard model one is the black line. And you can see how it compares with some standard model <coughs> uh, with beyond standard models models. And you can see that there is a large discrepancy at very high PT. So we developed an HTBB tagger for proton-proton collision using a deep neural network to identify jets that contain both the, beef, the big quarks from the boosted X decay uh, to understand why we want our network to tag uh, 
a single jet that contains both, both DB quarks, you can see here the topology of the decay. If we are in very boosted, the distances between the distance between the jets originated from the B quarks hadronization will be very little, and our detector is likely to reconstruct them as one single larger jet. So, concerning the simulation, we develop uh, a fast and reliable fr framework for uh, a pseudo detector experiment. So. You can see here we use PTI-8 to generate high energy physics events. Then to simulate the detector response, we use DELFIS. And to add some information to of the secondary vertex that is still missing, missing today in DELFIS, we use RAVE. All the simulation is run on a Azure uh, virtual machine that are run Ubuntu 18. Uh, with a standard configuration with six CPUs and uh, 56 gigabyte of uh, random access memory and one GPU. The simulation time is more or less for um, concerning the simulation time. We in one day we can simulate more almost 10 million events. Okay, concerning Andrea, our Andrea, could you please yeah. just have five minutes more? Okay, so concerning our simulated data, you can see we used an atlas like detector. Uh, that is one, uh, an atlas like detector. We produce a, a very IPT using the PTI 8 uh, classes, uh, PTI 8 classes uh, quark gluon to X quark for the signal. And for the background, we use the hard QCD processes. We reconstruct large radius jet that are anti KT jet with R equal one and variable uh, radius track jet with R max equal to 0.4 and, R, and minimum radius 0.02. On the right, you can see the, the substructure, the variable we are associated to each object. So we have jet substructure for larger jet and some kinematic variables while for, while for the variable R track jet, we have secondary vertex and kinematic variables. Concerning the dataset production, we select event with um, transverse momentum greater than 450 GV over, C, uh, over, C, over C, and pseudo rapidity less than two. And we collect the two uh, lead, uh, ISPT contained within the larger, larger jet. Concerning the ranking, we train 10 different cut boost model and we are able to produce this nice plot here, the legend maybe you can give it, give it a look later. And you can see that there is this descending trend. And to validate the ranking, we train other cut boost model by adding the variable as ranked by random uh, by the cut boost. And you can see that the performance is approached the complete model. Then there is the comparison with the feature ranking obtained with cut boost and random forest. And you can see that you can clearly distinguish cluster of variable, this is, these are the key variables, these are the almost irrelevant variables. Then we remove the correlated variable, here you can see the effects. It is much nicer to see in the random forest feature ranking, ranking where you have this plateau here in, in importance, that after uh, the reduction, after removing the correlated variable, they shrink in size. We tested our, so, our model is a deep neural network with these uh, features here. And concerning the performance, uh, each color corresponds to a different model. The pink one is a model trained using the best seven variable, variable from CatBoost plus 10 random variables. You can see that the performances are much lower than other model trained using the best 10 or 13 or 19 variables ranked from CatBoost. And Okay, we are using, a, I just want to highlight that we're using a ranking obtained from a totally different algorithm. So it's nice to see that it works uh, also with a neural network. And another uh, thing I would like to highlight is that the top 19 ranked variables performing at some point better than com the complete model. And this could be explained maybe because reducing the dimensionality allow us to uh, escape from accidental local minima that we are in and uh, that are hitting during the complete model training. But we are also uh, trying to see if there is some bugs in vertex reconstruction. 
I move to the conclusion. So we show a possible approach for ranked features using the most relevant non-correlated features are ranked by, uh, by a decisive algorithm. We show that the ranking obtained with different algorithms are, uh, let's say, compatible. And we also highlight that this ranking is somehow relevant for a neural network model. We are now uh, developing a new method to, be, to dig into details for the event time tuples of modern high energy physics experiment to reduce dimensionality and correlation. Thank you. Many thanks, Andrea, for your very nice talk. And thanks also for being in time. And now it's time for questions, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can see Jill's so, uh, raising. Jill, please. Jill, okay. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for the, the very nice presentation. Um, one thing I'm worried about is that when you do the feature ranking, uh, if you have correlated features in the data, the overall importance of those features is going to be shared across the features. So when you then do the removal based on the uh, correlation of the features, um, are you not at risk of removing uh, important, uh, more important features in place of less important features, simply because the ranking algorithm said that all these features are identical um, and spread the importance equally across them? I'm not sure if I explained myself very clearly. Yeah, uh, sorry, I missed your question in the middle. So it was there was just a little lag. If you could um, read the last part. Yeah, so I'm, I'm asking how, whether or not your method is at risk of removing um, features that are actually more important than other features that you end up retaining, simply because when you rank the features, um, correlated important features end up having lower importance. Okay, I see, I see your point. So, uh, I mean, the effect the effect is here. So uh, as you can see, um, OK. So the, the aim of removing the correlated variable after the ranking is just to have, let's say, a fixed order that could allow us to remove the variable. So it would be, let's say, almost the same. And you can see that the relevance obtained from this algorithm as some little fluctuation in this region, right? And I would expect that, let's say we are now using the new data set with a neural network. So I would expect that uh, if, uh, if the random forest was putting them in this position and then we was able to remove some variable by using the, by looking at the correlation with the, all the others in the plateau, I would not expect that this would affect our result. I mean, it's a nice test to do. Maybe at some point, I think we have done this, uh, but I'm not sure this would affect the neural network performances. So within this uh, plateau where you say 10 variables and then um, the next is the four variables, you, they're, they're the same variables, but you've just removed six, is that correct? Yeah. I, I can't read the names on the, the, second, on the first plot. Yeah, sorry. It's, uh, Maybe too little. Yeah. So you may not be removing the most optimal variables to remove, but at least you're not removing all the variables. Okay. I see your point. Yeah, I see your point. It's for sure a nice test that we should do. Thank you. Okay. okay. Any other question to Andrea? If not, uh, let's uh, proceed to the last yeah. uh, to the last good no I'm sorry <laughs> to the last um, talk in this uh, part, which is 
data analysis with GPU accelerated kernels, and it's by Irene Dutta. Okay, yeah, hi, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen and we can hear you perfectly. So okay. please, the room is yours. Okay. So, hi everyone. I'm a graduate student at Caltech. And today I'm gonna to be talking about data analysis with GPU accelerated kernels. So before I move on to the study, just to give an introduction of the problem. So a typical data analysis from a collider experiment involves running over a few terabytes of data and simulation samples repeatedly over the period of a year or longer. And the uh, compressed event sizes for such reduced data formats is usually a few kilobytes per event. For example, the CMS nano OD root files or the final root skimmed and tuples that are used in any generic analysis. For each iteration of the analysis, people usually submit a few hundred bad jobs. And then you carry out this iterations a few hundred times over the course of a full analysis. So it basically means that you spend a considerable time waiting for your results and in computation. So the goal of our study was to reduce the complexity and increase the speed of these analysis workflows so that you can deliver results faster. The standard HEP software framework, which is root is Basically, it consists of dynamically sized arrays and uh, C++ classes with arbitrary structure. Uh, usually you have like these billions of rows of events and then each event can have varying lengths of particle features. For example, a certain event might have three muons, whereas a different event might have zero muons and so on. But nowadays, high-speed parallel computing is becoming increasingly popular with the advent of GPUs and FPGAs. So we developed an analysis framework that is suitable for such parallel architecture needs. We call it HEP Accelerate. And uh, it's based on the approach which was uh, already introduced in the Python libraries of root and awkward arrays. So we basically follow these simple steps to carry out an analysis with our library. The first step is you take the data from the compressed events format and then change it to linear arrays of particle properties using awkward arrays. Then you perform parallel computations on linear arrays using kernels. And then finally you save results. Before I go into details of each of these steps, I want to emphasize here that we are only gonna show the computational performance and the goal was not to reproduce any already public physics results. So the first step is to transform the data structure. We do this with awkward arrays. So you basically uh, have varying number of particles per event, but you can load them as sparse arrays with one array for one particle feature and an additional array to mark the event boundaries. For example, here on the screen, there is a there are two arrays in purple. One is labeled the muon PT, the other is labeled the muon event boundaries. What the muon event boundaries does is it tells you the indices where the muons belonging to a particular event are. For example, the first two elements of this muon event boundaries say zero and three. What it means is that the first event has muons with index zero, one, and two in the muon PT uh, in the muon PT array. And then the next two elements are three and four in the muon event boundaries array. So what it means is that in the muon PT array, the second event only has the muon at the third index. And similarly, you can have uh, arrays for different particle features, for example, jets or electrons and so on. 
Then the next step is to perform parallel computation on these arrays using something called kernels. So a kernel is a function that is evaluated simultaneously on all elements of an array. For example, when you compute the square root of all the values in an array, when individual kernel cross across different data blocks are independent of each other, you can evaluate them in parallel using single instruction, multiple data processes. So basically what this means is, typically what you do is uh, something called a scalar operation. For example, you want to take the product of two kinds of elements of type A and type B. So you will usually loop over each element of type A, multiply it with type B to get the final value of type C. In a SIMD operation, you are essentially doing a matrix multiplication. So you basically have a column of type A, you multiply it with a column of type B to get the final column of type C. So such a columnar data analysis approach using single threaded kernels was already recognized in HEP using the coffee tool. What HEP Accelerate does is that it extends the computational efficiency and scalability of these kernels to multi-threaded CPUs. And we also propose a GPU implementation. So the idea is very simple. You don't want to loop over each event to calculate one physics variable per event. Instead, you want to use linear arrays so that you can parallelly compute physics variables across all events at once. So, and in doing that, you save time on expensive for loops. So how do you do that in the code? So here I have a small example. This uh, code calculates the sum PT of all jets in an event, which is the HT variable. So uh, this function takes in a few input arrays. One is this offsets array, which is this 1D array marking the event boundaries. Then it also takes in a PT underscore data, which is the 1D array of jet PTs. Then it takes in a mask underscore rows, which is a Boolean mask of events. That is, it stores information of all the events that pass your baseline selections. It takes in another input array called mask content, which is a Boolean mask of all jets. That is, it stores information of all the jets that pass your baseline selections. For example, you might have selections like uh, jet PT greater than 25 GB or something like that. And then the way you do it is first you have a parallel loop over all events, which is done with this uh, Numba function P range. This is basically CPU multi-threading enabled with Numba in Python. You can do the same thing with GPUs using CUDA. I have an example in backup. So anyway, moving on. So you have this loop in over all events in parallel, and then you check if not mask underscore rows IEV continues. So basically you see if your event passes the selections, you move on, otherwise you skip the event. And then you have a loop. Once you know that your event is passing your selections, you loop over particles in that event. So, then for ILM in range I0 to I1, you check if mask underscore content ILM, that is you are checking whether your jet passes your selections. If yes, then you add the jet PT to this out array, which is your final value of HT per event. And that would be the output of this function. So there are several such generic kernels which are already present in the library. I've listed some in the backup. We benchmarked our uh, library with the CERN open data. Basically, we carried out two analysis. One was with the 13 TV Atlas open data. We did the Higgs to ZZ to 4N analysis with 10 femtoban inverse of data. And on the plot on the left, you can see the invariant mass of the four leptons speaking at about 
125 GB. And then on the right, we did a top cock pair analysis using the CMS open data from 2012. And there I have a plot for the HT variable for all events that pass some selections. So basically the goal of this slide is to tell you that this can work well for data formats from different experiments. We also evaluated some computational performance results with the CMS open data. Basically these results are produced on about 144 gigabytes of CMS open data. And uh, the benchmark analysis implemented the following things. We applied some event selections and object selections. That is, we had some trigger bit selections, missing energy selections, some jet or lepton selections based on PT8, et cetera. We did event paid computations based on histogram lookups. That is, we had pile up reweighting, lepton efficiency corrections, and so on. We applied jet energy correction systematics based on histogram lookups. We also do high level variable reconstruction. For example, uh, reconstructing the top core candidate from the jet triplet with an invariant mass closest to 173 GV. We evaluate a multi layer feed forwarded DNN using TensorFlow in the code with about 40 high level inputs. And then finally, we save all DNN inputs and outputs along with the systematic variations to about 1,000 histograms. So when we did this uh, simple prototypical analysis, we observed the following things. The first thing was that uh, the GPU accelerated version was performing about 12 times faster than a single multi-threaded CPU. So if you look at the plot on the right, we basically used eight NVIDIA GTX GPUs with two compute streams per device. And we had one CPU with 24 threads. And what we see is that the multi-GPU stream was doing about 12 times faster than the multi-threaded CPU version. We also noticed that in a complex analysis where you redo the main workload several times, for example, when you apply jet energy corrections, you are basically redoing your main analysis about 40 times. The multi-GPU version can perform about 15 times faster than a multi-threaded CPU alone. But uh, it's also important to keep in mind that you always need to balance the overhead of these kernel scheduling calls with the time that you spend in your actual computation. So it's most beneficial to run on large data sets. It's very encouraging to see that uh, physics analysis can be implemented very easily on GPUs. In the future, maybe multiple GPU machines can be viable but that would depend uh, also on the availability and the pricing of resources. So to summarize, we demonstrate the possibility of carrying out a high energy physics data analysis with efficient input data preparation using linear arrays and then using specialized kernels for parallel computation in, on these arrays. On multi-threaded CPU, you can do this uh, in Python with the Numba package. It's also possible to do these array computation on GPUs, which are highly efficient at parallel processing. This library is generic and it can be used to work with data formats from different experiments. And we show that it's possible to run an order of magnitude faster on a multi-GPU machine as compared to a single multi-threaded CPU. So thanks. Thanks a lot, Irene, uh, for your uh, very interesting talk. And now we have time for questions. Please. Irene, this is Massimo Caccia from INFM Milan and Universidad de Linsubre. I have one question. In your 12x gain, that you mentioned, are you taking into account also the time it takes to reform the data according to the awkward arrays that you mentioned? 
or 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 this is behind the data reformatting um yeah it takes into account that time yes it's taking this into account so it's 12x irrespective from the need for data reformatting yes so what we don't take into account in this benchmark analysis is uh, where we uh, for example, the initial formatting of the data, for example, if you were trying to have, if you access this data from somewhere far away, the time it takes okay. to open the okay. for, don't for sure, that. but this, this, is, this is going to be, say, the same, irrespective from the fact that you use a multi-threaded CPU or a GPU. Mm -hmm. No, but, but, but just to make sure I got it right, so you download the data from where they are, you reformat the data and you run your analysis, Yeah. right? And then it, the question is, presume that you formatted initially the data already according to your format, so according to the awkward arrays, then the gain is going to be much higher, right? True, yeah, if you, if you run on uh, awkward arrays, which are already present somewhere, yes, for example, yeah. if you can, have... Can, can you give me an estimate rather than 12x, it goes up to 20x or 25x? Um, okay, I, uh, it's hard to give an estimate like that because- Okay, uh, okay. fair enough. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, another question maybe? Okay, it's- uh... Liz, again. Hi, yeah. Um, I, you mentioned in your second to last slide that um, the uh, size of the data set, you can, you know, if it's large enough, you mitigate the overheads that you were just talking about. Um, I wonder if you can give me a sense of um, the size that you think is kind of the minimal you would go to um, this new way of doing things. And um, do you think, and then a second question is, do you think it will scale to the HLLHC sort of data sizes? Okay, so for the first question, I think, uh... The answer would be like, if you are just running over a few megabytes of data, then it makes no difference. Let's say, uh, you know, in the initial stages, when you have a small root and tuple and you are just making some checks and then establishing your baseline analysis, probably they are gonna perform the same. But once you have uh, like even a few GBs of data, this will definitely do better. And then uh, for the second question, I think, yes, it's okay. So uh, that answer is also a little bit more complicated, like scalability to HL, let's see, like computation-wise, code-wise, there should be no problem. But uh, it's important to keep in mind that for these kind of improvements, it's in important to have the data locally. If you have it somewhere on a tier two, which is in a remote corner of the world, you spend a lot of time trying to just open the root file. And then uh, all these speedups may not be that useful. So if you have like a lot of data, it's also useful if you have it closer to you. Sure, I, I think that some sort of Xcash infrastructure is being planned for HLLHC. And I think that would marry well to this sort of thing. Um, so yes, you definitely need that other research as well. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the question. And uh, another question maybe, or not? Okay, uh, there doesn't seem to be any. So I would conclude this part of this afternoon session. And uh, because we are a little bit um, delayed, uh, I would uh, ask you to reconvene at uh, quarter past 
six. So I will I will meet you then. Jestli chceš, tak já to teďka vypnu, protože já to můžu poslouchat na sluchátka, běž mi klej. Já ne, nechci to, já to spíš Je, že jsme, že máme kolem 90 a ten díl. Máš tě kusek? Ten metr most to je strašný. Já na to furt zapomínám a do mě tam furt lidi něco píšel. Já už jsem, že to nemusí píšet. Jak se to vrne? To se napíšel. Jak se stále dostanou do jiného? Já chci prostě jenom jednu, jeden obrázek. Co k tam nechleješ, no? Já nevím. Myslím, že dva nebá se poslední domluvil. Tak. To byla, no. Tak jo. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mute my mic. So sorry. Yeah, for... yeah, uh, sorry. I... You did have to listen to another language. <laughs> uh, excuse me, what did you want to say? Uh, sorry, I was just going to let you know that you were um, unmuted. Yes, thanks a lot. Thank you. It's it's uh, inconvenient. I know. I'm sorry.
Hello. The coffee break is finished, so it's time to, to resume. For the last part of this first session, we'll have two talks. The first one is by Giuseppe Cerati, who will discuss about the parallelization in high energy event reconstruction. So Giuseppe, if you can start sharing your slide. Uh, yes, let me try. Let me go full screen. Do you still see them? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, so I will, I will present uh, on behalf of the MK Fit and SIDAC for Heprico project teams. And we talk about paralyzation for HEP event reconstruction. Um, as an introduction, I would like to, to quote a, a song by the REM and actually uh, paraphrase it. It's the end of Moore's law as we know it and I, and I feel fine. Um, so it's a big change, uh, but uh, the end of Moore, Moore's law, but we can feel fine if we can um, turn this, this change into an opportunity and to turn this in, into an opportunity, we need to exploit different level of paralyzation, like vectorization and multi-threading. We need to exploit the new technologies that are dominating the, the market, uh, GPU and, and what will come next. And uh, we need to exploit the um, HPC centers that are building exascale machines. So um, as we all know, the next generation of HP experiments will, will collect a, a huge amount of data and that will increase the corresponding processing time. So we need the new computing technologies. And I will focus in particular on two um, areas um, of, uh, the, of two experiments um, and two type of detectors, so CMS and the liquid argon TPC experiments, and we need to get ready for the ILUMI LHC and DUNE. Let's start from the LHC. Here, what drives the, the increase in complexity is, is pileup. And uh, as you can see from the, this plot, uh, the uh, reconstruction time grows uh, exponentially with increasing luminosity and increasing pileup. And uh, um, the dominant fraction in this reconstruction time is uh, occupied by, by tracking. So it, it's more than 50% of, of the full reconstruction time. So traditionally, uh, HP experiments have been using Kalman filter methods to perform tracking because they demonstrate high efficiency and have a robust handling of, handling of material effects. So the step that dominates is, is the building. So, it's the, so you, you start from a seed and you pick up along along the, the track trajectory, all the hits that belong to the track. This is a combinatorial algorithm because in some cases you find only one hit, and so that's good, but in other cases you find multiple compatible hits and, and you have to, to branch and uh, explore both options. In other cases you don't find any hit, so it's a, a, it's a combinatorial algorithm that is a challenge to parallelize, and parallelizing it is the mission of the MKFIT project. Uh, the, the key points that the MKFIT uh, uh, code make use of are, first of all, the multiplex library that, that we designed for SIMD processing of track candidates. The idea here is that uh, small matrices that are using Kalman filter are processed in, uh, in, in, in batches of, um, of a number that correspond to the vector unit size, and they operate in lockstep mode, um, which, is, uh, which is not trivial to achieve. But uh, thanks to this uh, library, we uh, gain speed ups from vectorization, as we will see. We also exploit multi-threading at multiple levels with TBB tasks, and the multiple levels are uh, events, regions in the detector, and bunches of seeds. And another very important point is to reduce the memory footprint so that the, the cache bandwidth is not um, limitation in the performance and we do this various way the most important is the lightweight detector description and you can see here an example of uh, the actual geometry representation that we use our results are that in terms of physics performance you can see the efficiency versus pt here in red is mk fit in blue uh, the standard uh, cms tracking um, the, so the first iteration and you can see that they they perform consistently, so uh, MKFIT is able to reproduce the physics result of uh, uh, CMSSW. 
and we achieve uh, in our standalone application speed ups of up to a factor of three from vectorization and up to 35 X for multi-threading across multiple collision events, as you can see in this plot. MKFIT is now integrated in, in CMSW. And uh, from this plot, you can see that with a single threaded application, MKFIT, uh, which is used only for track building is a six time faster. Uh, in, in order to achieve this, we, we use uh, ICC as a, as a compiler with the VX512 extension. So in, it's a fun fact, uh, building with MKFIT is now faster than, than the track fit, which is not com combinatorial. That's something that MKFIT has, has not tackled yet, the track fitting, at least in CMSW. And, and the integration, the CMS workflow are, are currently um, ongoing. So uh, great news. We we have a paper that is out and uh, has been recently accepted for publication in GINST. So it's, it's already on the archive and feel free to take a look for more details about uh, the MKFIT algorithm. Uh, beyond the paper and, and beyond what was already presented, we are moving towards um, general direction of trying to, to exploit uh, GPUs and other architectures. First uh, um, attempt uh, is to um, is in the direction of uh, silicon strip heats, which are the main input to the MKFIT algorithm. And we would like to use GPUs to speed up the processing of, uh, of the silicon strip data. We started with the unpacking of the data and the clustering algorithm, first with a standalone version, and now as a CMSW producer. Um, as you can see here, the data transfer uh, take about the same time as the as the actual kernels on, on the GPU. And uh, in this case, we are still working to optimize the, the workload uh, because right now it's not enough to saturate the, the GPU. And an option is that when we will add more kernels, uh, this will be less of a problem. And the next step will be to evaluate the heat positions and produce heats in the MKFIT data format so that they will be directly used by MKFIT. Another aspect that we're working on is uh, the exploration of, uh, of portable code. Um, and so the reason here is that uh, the future will bring even more heterogeneous machines. And uh, in order to avoid rewriting the, the software for each platform, we need to, to write it once in a portable way. And we are, we are testing different options for uh, portable code implementations. First uh, attempts were based on OpenACC and, and Cocos, giving promising results, but now we're we are now um, working towards a much more complete suite of measurements that will include a, um, a broader range of, of tools as well as different compilers. Uh, let's move to the to the second topic. Uh, so the second type of experiments is uh, the liquid argon uh, time projection chamber neutrino experiments. And so this experiment produce uh, data that can be represented like images, as you can see here, where the x-axis are wires and the, the y-axis is, is, is the time and the z-axis is the charge that is collected in, in each wire. So you, um, and so yeah, these images are, are really beautiful and uh, allow for great, great detail in the, in the uh, in studying the neutrino interactions. Um, while these images are, are beautiful, they are, uh, it's not so easy to reconstruct uh, uh, this data for, for many reasons, and it takes a uh, order of minutes in, in, a, uh, in, in a sort of a rather small experiment like Microboon and with, the, with upcoming uh, new experiments that are much bigger in size. Of course, the overall time is a, is a challenge. The good news is that these detectors are modular in nature, so we can exploit parallelism. And uh, we, we pioneered the first uh, the parallelization of a first algorithm, which is the heat finder, which is a very simple algorithm. The, 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 what it does is to identify the, the pulses on, on, um, on the wire uh, data, identify the peak position and um, extract the, the width. Uh, this is simple, but takes a significant fraction of the reconstruction workflow. Uh, and this depends on, on the experiment, but can range between uh, the percent to few tenths of, of percent of the of, of the overall reconstruction workflow. Um, so we successfully parallelized this algorithm. We we moved to our own implementation of the minimization algorithm that allow us to 
uh, to optimize it uh, uh, more directly. And this shows that uh, we achieve uh, significant speed ups already at this stage without any parallelization. Then we we uh, we profiled the application and found that uh, the minimization was still the dominant uh, portion of the of, of the code that was taking most of the time. So we identified specific loops and vectorized them. And uh, we also uh, multi-threaded across events and across wires. The results is that from vectorization, we, we get a speed up up to a factor of two when we compile again with ICC and VX512. And uh, we started with an, an OpenMP multi-threading that had a, has a very good scaling at low thread counts and, and reaches a, a, up to a factor of 30 speed up. Um, the physics output uh, is uh, nearly identical to the original algorithm. Uh, a new version was recently integrated in Lastsoft, which is experiment code, code base, and this now uses the TBB, uh, which is compatible with, uh, with, with the framework. Um, and this, uh, this work has now been adopted by experiments like Icarus and, and Dune, and it's uh, uh, on, on, a, on a single thread application, it's up to 10 times faster than the previous version. So this is a, a significant impact on the reconstruction time of the experiments. We have also been exploring uh, fast Fourier transform libraries because they are core component of the signal processing algorithms for liquid argon TPC. We have compared the uh, FFTW and MKL libraries where um, MKL is pre-compiled with AVX512 and we compiled FFTW with different vector extensions using GCC. And uh, you can see on, on this plot that uh, uh, with AVX512 or AVX2, um, FFTW gets a speed up of over a factor of three, and that FFTW and MKL have a, have a similar performance. Um, so the next Giuseppe, step, is, yes. Giuseppe, sorry, you have five minutes left. Huh? Oh, okay, there should be plenty. Thank you. Um, so the next step for this project is uh, uh, that we are uh, working towards developing a reconstruction workflow for HPC Center, and we are um, targeting as a as a, uh, initial goals, Icarus experiment and uh, the Theta supercomputer. The goal for us is to have an efficient utilization of the parallel resources of HPC. And uh, as hopefully I convinced you, you need to have a custom compilers and custom vector extension to achieve this. So the challenge is to, is to build the software stack of the experiments so that we can, we can use uh, the the best compilers and the best extensions for each uh, for each application and uh, uh, technology like Spark can help us uh, to do this. And we have been uh, able to compile uh, the the code software with with Spark on Fairbill machines. We are still working on a couple of tests, but we are very close to moving moving on to Theta. And uh, the the workflow part uh, is is being worked on by a collaborating project, uh, and you can find the link there. And uh, they use tools like uh, HDF5 and HEPNOS to organize the data and uh, uh, DIY to distribute the workload uh, uh, with MPI across the nodes. Um, this is just an advertisement. If, if those, these topics are of interest for you, please join us in the SNOMAS uh, process, especially there is a computational frontier workshop coming up. Feel free to take a look and register. So uh, this gets me to, to the summary. We have been working on projects that are actively working to exploit the new computing architectures to speed up the reconstruction of current and future HP experiments. So one side of the project is MKFIT, where now we have a Kalman filter track building that gets large speed ups from parallelization. This is now integrated in CMSSW, six times faster on a single thread application. And we are working towards um, deploying this algorithm in the official CMS workflows and we are exploring GPU and portable applications. On the liquid argon TPC side, we have vectorized, multi-threaded the heat finder. It's now about 10 times faster and is already adopted by, by a few experiments. And we have work in progress to define a workflow for efficient usage at the HPC centers. So, uh, and with this, I want to uh, acknowledge the funding agencies and please take a look at our project website to have more information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giuseppe, for this uh, very nice talk. So, question now, there is time for question. 
Scrum. Hi, Giuseppe. That was a really nice talk. You covered an awful lot of material in a short time. Um, I, I have one like little niggle, though, with you, uh, which is on slide four, when you show the um, scaling of, of tracking with pileup. I, I think the thing you always have to bear in mind with those plots is that that's basically what happens if you take run to tracking and you extend it into pileup regimes where it's not been optimized at all. Um, and, and you have to be a bit careful because, um, you know, when you re-optimize for pileup 140, pileup 200, you can get quite a lot better performance even out of the, the algorithms that we use today. Um, and then when you do things like upgrade the tracker, um, you know, Atlas can now do tracking faster with the ITK at pileup 200 than we can with um, the current tracker at pileup 60. So just a, a wee pinch of salt um, uh, yeah, so with that. Uh, but my real question um, was actually about slide eight, um, which I thought was, was very interesting that you were showing that, you know, just doing um, the unpacking and the clustering on the GPU doesn't uh, give you very efficient usage of it. And I think this is the experience that we're learning with GPUs, that you want to stay on the GPU for as long as you possibly can. So could I ask really, what, what do you think the prospects are for full tracking on the GPU so that you can really stay and crunch all of the data and then just push the final results back when you're finished? So uh, let me go back to the, what you first mentioned. Um, so this plot, of course, uses the same uh, tracking configuration and the same detector. We could not go past uh, 140 because it doesn't make sense uh, anymore to use. Well, actually, you cannot use that detector above 50 or, or, or 70. And uh, um, it's true that uh, with with new versions of, of, the, of the tracking, you can uh, uh, have a speed ups, but uh, Without these big changes in the in the in the low level um, implementation of, of, of tracking, many of the changes that you can do will have an impact on, on the phase space of, of tracking and will sacrifice maybe displaced tracks or low PT tracks, which are very important for for the physics. Um, and uh, um, so the so the prospects for uh, full tracking on on GPU, I think it depends on which type of algorithm you want to test. Uh, so there are already applications that uh, uh, are able to do to do tracking on, on, on GPUs. For instance, the, uh, the CMS seeding is already using uh, a cellular automaton on, uh, on GPU, or um, LHCP is running tracking on, on GPU. For the Kalman filter, the fact that it's, it's combinatorial, that makes it more difficult. And uh, I'm not able to um, uh, to project and say whether that will work or not, as you can as as you can see from the, the next slide, we are actually we are continuously working to to explore this this possibility. So that we are now also testing. Uh, so we started from a single function from our uh, Kalman filter code, and we are testing it with portable implementations, and things look, look good for this single function. But of course, that's just one of many and we will grow the, the application towards something that is uh, larger and we'll see if that can converge or not, but it's difficult to make a projection. Uh, thanks, yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot of work to be, be done here, but indeed quite hopeful results from LHCB and, and actually Alice have been doing tracking on GPUs for a while, but uh, sort of a different working point from the GPDs. Thanks. You're welcome. Sorry, my microphone was closed. Any other question? Okay, if not, uh, thanks again, uh, Giuseppe, for, you. your, uh, for your talk. And uh, then we can move uh, to the last talk of this session. This talk uh, will be given by Laurent, and uh, it is about the usage of uh, optical processing unit for tracking in calorimetry at LHC. Yes, absolutely. Please. Uh, 
So I am Laurent. I am. I was uh, working both at the LRI and uh, IGC Lab, which was formerly known as uh, LAL. On this topic, I was working with uh, one uh, intern, Ms. Ajit, one uh, PhD student, Aishik, and uh, David Rousseau, which is a permanent position. And uh, the work is in the context of the high luminosity LHC, where we'll have uh, far higher readouts. Uh, than we have currently with the LHC. And we try to see that if maybe there are uh, new and innovative solutions um, to, to work on problems, uh, some uh, lateral thinking, and that's how we fell upon something called uh, optical processing units. So first I will present uh, what it is and how it works. And then I will uh, show two use cases. First, how we try to use this uh, technology for tracking and then for calorimetry. Um, but first, the, the OPU, uh, the general ID is the one from supervised uh, machine learning. If you take the textbook examples, you have this uh, big matrix of features, uh, X, a ground truth, uh, then you have your algorithm, and then you can nicely separate signal and background. In real life, it's uh, never like this, and nicely linearly separable, and you have to retort to some tricks. One of them that's uh, used a lot is uh, support vector machines, uh, where you go to a space of higher dimension where your data is separable. And, uh, and to do this, you have a maximum margin classifier, and uh, you use something called a kernel trick, which allows you to stay in a low dimension, not to go in this higher uh, dimensional thing, but Still, if you have a lot of data, you still have to compute uh, n times n uh, distances, which can uh, amount to a lot. And uh, 13 years ago, uh, an ID came, which I'll call a kitchen sink, that showed that uh, you can actually project your data into an even lower dimensional space uh, made of uh, random features that approximate the kernel that you use previously for SVM. And it works quite well. It has almost the same discrimination power as usual estimators. And now the bottleneck actually is to uh, do the multiplication by a random matrix and then add a nonlinearity. And the idea of the OPU is this that, uh, well, multiplying by a random matrix is not really hard. Uh, Let's imagine that you have a laser, and then it impedes into something called a DMD, a digital, digital sorry, micro mirror device. Uh, it's uh, just one million uh, mirrors that can turn left and uh, or right, and then reflect or not your signal. And then this goes through a so-called diffusive medium. And uh, what this is just uh, white paint on glass. And if you do this at the other side of your diffusive medium, if you record it with the camera, what you record is actually the result of a random matrix multiplication uh, with a transmission matrix that is known and constant for a device and a nonlinearity because uh, you measure the square. And the idea is that the bottleneck that you had previously, something that can be extremely well done uh, physically, uh, literally at the speed of light, because if you have 1 million bits as an input, then you, your, um, if you multiply them uh, one, uh, by each other, you have a matrix of 10 to the 12 pixels. And you can compute this at a rate of 2 kilohertz, which means you can re-achieve something akin to 10 to 15 operations per second for the price of only a few watts. So extremely fast, you can have at the output uh, what, you, what you can see on the, on the right here, uh, random features. Uh, in practice, you will use 10,000 to 100,000 of them. And uh, once again, what's interesting is that uh, they are IID. Uh, the results of the multiplication of two nearby points in the diffusive medium, uh, they, are not, they are not more correlated than two points that were at the opposite of the DMD. So uh, just to, to make a summary of uh, how it's used, you have your data, you find a nice way to binarize it into 1 million of bits. You put everything through the UPU, and then you have a lot of random features. And that's only the moment when uh, you ask yourself what you want to do with them. 
you take a ground truth, uh, y, uh, you take those random features and using a linear algorithm, which will be super fast. Typically, we use a reg regression algorithm. Uh, you can uh, have results that are close from the one that would use uh, a lot of more computing power. So the, the game is not to have the best possible rejection, is to have uh, it really fast with a few training examples. Uh, so let's see how it works in practice on a tracking problem. Uh, we restarted from a so-called toy data set, which was used uh, before the TrackML challenge. Uh, the idea is it's a two-dimensional uh, representation of a tracker. Uh, you have nine layers uh, for a total of uh, half a million pixels. And each of the 60,000 events can consist of between three and 20 tracks. Uh, here you have, for instance, on the left, uh, an example with four tracks. And uh, well, we use this data set. Uh, first, really as a proof of concept, we ask ourselves, uh, can it infer the parameters of uh, only uh, one track? So we just kept one track per event. We find a way to binarize it. Basically, you have half a million pixels on uh, the data set. You have more, one million pixels on the UPU. So it's a mapping of one to two. So we binarize each and every of the events, we pass them through the UPU, we get our random features, and then we compare them to the ground truth, uh, which consists of two parameters, the angle, phi, and the inverse momentum. The results are this. So we try in a rich regression of this. We use 5,000 random features. Uh, y is either the ground truth angle or the inverse momentum. And uh, the results are this. Uh, for the angle, you can see the prediction versus the true value. And you can see that the prediction is really quite well. Both values are really well corrected. The, um, the error is Gaussian with a sigma of 0 0.25 radians. Uh, and the same goes for the inverse momentum. You can see that uh, prediction versus true value are well correlated with a sigma, once again, Gaussian, uh, and equal to 2.5 times the minus 4 inverse uh, Jeff. So to be clear, those values are not uh, as good as it would be with a dedicated algorithm. Once again, uh, we try to make a proof of concept. And as you can see, uh, using this OPU, it works. We try to go further and to use the OPU for the whole heavens. And, uh, to make a representation, the idea was to turn to something called uh, reservoir computing, which is that uh, each layer, uh, half of the pixels is dedicated to representation of what happens to this current layer, and half of them uh, just takes back the random features coming uh, from the OPU from the previous layer which keeps some kind of memory of whichever happened before. And we hoped that uh, by going to further layers, it would keep a memory of what happened before in the trajectory. And we could um, compute things from this. Uh, so we did this. I will uh, just uh, get fast on this. Uh, maybe the bottom left plot, you can see the true value versus the predicted one. Sorry for the inverting of the axis. If uh, so, uh, what we predicted was the position of, so we, we took all the events which had 16 uh, hits on the previous to last layer and 16 hits on the last ones. And we tried to predict the position on the last layer uh, given only uh, whatever happened before. And you can see a correlation between what's predicted and what we have. Now, the problem is that if we compare it to a really simple estimator, uh, you can see on the top left plot the orange one, the naive estimator is, OK, the, the prediction is just you take whatever happened in a penultimate layer, just project it on the last layer, just keep the same angle position. And if you just do this uh, simple thing, you can see that the standard deviation is far lower than with a prediction, which is uh, really bad news. So just conclusion on tracking is that uh, the various estimations we make 
makes sense. So it's not fully stupid, but uh, it's far worse than naive algorithm. And maybe the problem is that casting a program for the OPU is hard, and uh, maybe the OPU could be more suited to calorimetry. So we did the same thing with uh, trying to reproduce the results from two different articles. Uh, those two articles were using huge uh, CNN on huge computers using hundreds of thousands of events. And we tried to see how close we could approximate them using a, a simpler, um, less events. The first article whose results we tried to reproduce was this. Uh, basically, you have a signal made of uh, SUSY events, a background of QCD events. Uh, you can see a typical event uh, for both on the two top plots, uh, the normalized distribution uh, below. Uh, training sample was huge, as I said, 400,000 events in the original article. And uh, the calorimeter was uh, represented by uniform 64 times 64 bins. Uh, the intensity being the energy deposited. Uh, once again, two steps. First one is to digitize the... Uh, Laurent, sorry, yes. you have uh, five minutes. Yes, okay, thanks. Uh, so for the discretization, what we did is that if a pixel had no signal, we just took 000, zero, zero if it, uh, and then we uh, checked the um, energy quantiles. If you had low energy, we took 001, uh, middle 011, and high energy 111. Uh, the output was a single output non-neural network, which emulated a ridge regression. Uh, so basically, we did the same as before. And the results are here. On the original paper, on the top left, you can see the results from the CNN, which are excellent. And on the top right, the results from this study. Using only the OPU in blue, you can see that the results are quite poor. They are even less worse than simple physical cuts. But then we say, OK, we, we have a random feature that we can use to input on standard BDTs uh, uh, with handcrafted features. And maybe they will be orthogonal and will have a higher rejection. And you can compare the green curve, which is BDT, and the uh, red curve, which has the output of the OPU. And you can see that we achieve a higher rejection. And the point is the, that uh, on calorimetry, we have better results than before. It's not on par with the results from the CNN, but OPU with the BDT are extremely scalable and robust. The left plot shows the results using only 4,000 training images, which is 1% of uh, the sample that was used in the original study. And we match the results from the physical selections. OK, uh, and finally, last uh, study. It's kind of the same. Uh, this time, we had two kind of signals, W and TT bar. Background was QCD. We had 100,000 events each. Uh, several estimators and several representations in the article. The one I will focus on uh, divided the uh, calo in five subarrays for three kinds of particles and bins the energy in those kind of arrays. Uh, once again, I maybe won't delve much into the discretization part, but it's uh, the same. We divide into quantiles. If we have the higher quantiles, we uh, multiply uh, more bits. And uh, so on the, the left part is the process for one the detector. And on the, on the right part, it's the results for all uh, 15 arrays from before. So we have this representation. We put it through uh, the OPU. And we get these results uh, that have to be compared to the ones from the original article. In particular, I draw your attention to uh, so-called raw image classifier in the original article, which achieved 91% of area under the curve for TT bar and 80% for W. And on the bottom plot, with a ridge regression, you have our results as a function of number of variables and the number of samples. And you can see that if we go towards 20,000 of each, we achieve the same numbers, 91% here and around 80% there, using only a fifth of what they use as a number of samples. Which brings me to my summary. Uh, OPU is a physical device that allows to reduce the classification dimensionality and the training time through the use of a physical random matrix. We tried to use it on two problems. First on tracking, where we 
made actual estimations of various parameters, but they were quite poor. So it made sense, but it didn't match traditional methods. On the other hand, on calorimetry, it was far more interesting because uh, on the first study, we had a robust and fast training, faster than a state of the art and using 1% of the training data. And it's in the second study, when we increased the number of uh, random features and samples to one fifth of what was in the original study, we could match one of them of their classifiers. So in summary, the OPU can maybe have a niche application for frequent retrainings on a few events. Uh, it remains to see if it can really be cast for real HTTP applications. Thank you. So thank you very much, Laurent. Any question? I see no ends. Okay, this is really, how can I say, uh, a, a, a new, uh, a really yes. a, a new way, a new other. So probably people need some more time to yes. digest. And it, I think it, it, it's quite dense. I, I do agree. exactly. Then it's quite dense, and so I think that people need more time to digest. And I think that I'm sure that the discussion will be moved on uh, on on, on matter most. Yes, sure. So if. Uh, this was the last uh, talk uh, of this session. So uh, let's thank uh, Lauren again. Thank you. In general, let's. Uh, we ended our session. So uh, thank you very much again to all of you for having joined and attended uh, this uh, today. And uh, thanks again to all the speakers. And uh, uh, let's reconvene uh, tomorrow at the same time for the second uh, live session. Thank you, Elisabetta. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.